Chapter 15 of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15, With the Wagon Teams. Soon after daybreak on the twelfth day, the watch, which had now been carefully kept up for some days, reported that two Indians were galloping at full speed up the valley. A cheer broke from the defenders of the butte, for they doubted not that these brought news of the approach of a relieving party. When the horsemen arrived at the main encampment out on the plain, a stir was immediately visible, and in two or three minutes the Indians were seen running out to the horses grazing on the plain beyond, while loud yells rang through the air. "'Those who have got rifles had better come to the edge,' Long Tom shouted. "'All these fellows who are here will be scooting out on the plain in a minute. We must stop a few of them anyhow.' A minute or two later, scores of Indians dashed out from the trees at the foot of the buttes and ran toward their encampment. The whites at once opened fire, but a running man far below was a difficult mark, and not a single shot took effect. "'Y'all don't call that shooting,' Bronco Harry said indignantly. "'It is all very well, Harry,' Hugh said, "'but a brown spot three hundred feet below you and as many yards away isn't an easy mark.' "'Well,' Harry said, "'it can't be helped.' Now we will get ready to go out to lend a hand to our friends. Let us have a couple of ropes. We will tie them to the branches one by one and haul them up. There's no fear of an attack. Now, look here, Jim. You and your lot had best stop here to guard the women, and we will sally out. There are five of you. That will be plenty. The man on watch now gave a shout. I can see them, he said. How many of them? I guess there's about eighty. There's a thick clump in the middle. I reckon that they are the soldiers, and thirty or four are riding loose. I allow there are cowboys. That is just about the right number, Harry said. If there was more of them, the Indians wouldn't fight. I don't know as they will now, but seeing as there must be 300 of them, I expect they'll try it. Now then, up with these branches. In a quarter of an hour, the branches were all hauled out of the gap. While this had been going on, the women had given a feed and a good drink of water to the horses, for there was no occasion any longer to husband their resources. The animals were now saddled and led down through the gap. By this time, the Indians were all mounted and were moving in a close body across the plain to meet the advancing foe. Now, Jim, Bronco Harry said, you stand on the ledge, and when you see the fight begin, you wave your hand. We can't make a start until they are at it, and we shan't be able to see down below there. The cowboys made their way down through the plain and then mounted. They sat for ten minutes with their eyes fixed upon Jim Gatling. Presently, he waved his arm, and with a shout, they started at a gallop. As soon as they were fairly out on the plain, they heard the sound of firearms and, after galloping half a mile, came suddenly in view of the combat. The Indians had boldly closed with the troops and cowboys who were now driven together. A desperate hand-to-hand -hand conflict was raging. Swords flashing in the sun, waving tomahawks, and spears could be seen above the masses. The cracking of revolvers was incessant, and a light smoke hung over the conflict. They are hard at it, boys, Long Tom explained. Now don't shout until we're on them. They are too busy to notice us. Keep well together, and we shall go through them like a knife. Not a word was spoken as they galloped down upon the scene of conflict. When they were within a hundred yards, a cry of warning was raised, and some of the Indians faced round. But in a moment, with a loud shout, the band of cowboys charged down upon them and cleft their way into the mass, horse and rider rolling over under the impetus of the onslaught. The deadly six-shooters spoke out while the Indians fell thickly around them, and in a minute they had joined the whites in the center of the mass. There was a shout of welcome, and then the officer commanding the troops cried, Now's your time, lads. Press them hard. Give it them hot. And the united party attacked the Indians with fresh vigor. Up to this time, there had been little advantage on either side. Many more of the Indians had fallen than of the whites, owing to the superiority of the latter's weapons, especially the revolvers of the cowboy section. Still, their great superiority in numbers was telling, and when the six shooters were emptied, the cowboys had no weapons to oppose the spears and tomahawks of the Indians. The sudden attack from the rear, however, had shaken the redskins. In the momentary pause that had ensued, many of the cowboys slipped fresh cartridges into their pistols, and in a short time the Indians began to give ground, while the less courageous of them wheeled about their horses' heads. War Eagle and some of the chiefs fought desperately, but when the former fell, cut down by one of the troopers, a panic spread among his followers, and, as if by a sudden impulse, they turned and fled. The pursuit was a short one, for the horses of the rescuing force were jaded with the long journey they had performed. Those of the party from the butte were weakened by hunger, while the ponies of the Indians had been doing nothing for days and speedily left them behind. After hearty congratulations by the rescuers and sincere thanks by those whom they had relieved from their peril, the party returned to the scene of the conflict. Four troopers and two cowboys had fallen, and a score had received wounds more or less serious. 
while on the part of the Indians, over 30 lay dead. Graves were dug for the fallen whites, the wounds of the others were bandaged up, and they then proceeded to the butte, at whose foot the women and the settlers who had been left to guard them had already gathered, they having hurried down as soon as they saw the plain covered with flying Indians. Steve had returned with the rescuing party and had been severely wounded in the fight. A blow from a tomahawk having cut off one of his ears, wounded his cheek, and inflicted a terrible gash on his shoulder. He was, however, in the highest spirits. I shan't look so purty, my dear, he said to his daughter, who burst into tears at the sight of his injury. But then I was not anything uncommon afore, and I haven't any thought of going courting again. Well, we have given the engines a smart lesson. When the handshaking and congratulations ceased, the captain commanding the cavalry held a consultation with Steve and some of the cowboys as to the advisability of following up the victory and attacking the Indians in their own villages. I should not feel justified in doing it unless I was pretty certain of success. The commandant of the fort gave me orders to rescue this party, and I've done so, but he said nothing about engaging in a regular campaign with the Indians. I shouldn't try, Captain, Steve said. I reckon they haven't half their force here today, no, nor a quarter, for they reckon to put a thousand fighting men in the field. They didn't guess as any of us had got off to get help and knew that they had plenty here to keep us caged upon the butte. Another thing is, the cowboys with us are all employed on the ranches, and although they came off willing to rescue the women and pay the engines off for that murdering business at our settlement, I reckon they will want to be off again to their work. But even with them, we ain't no match for the forces the Redskins can collect, so if you will take my advice, Captain, you won't waste a minute, for there's no saying how soon they will be down on us again, and if they did come, the fight today wouldn't be a circumstance to the next. You are right, the officer said. It would be folly to risk anything by waiting here. I suppose you're all ready to start? I reckon so, Steve said. The horses have all been brought down from the hill. The officer at once gave orders to mount. While this conversation had been going on, Hugh, who was occupied in giving Prince a good feed from the grain the soldiers had brought for their horses, saw one of the troopers staring at him. Hello, Luscombe, he exclaimed. Who would have thought of seeing you here? I thought I couldn't be mistaken, Hugh the other exclaimed as they grasped each other's hands. But you've changed so much and you widened out so tremendously in the 18 months since I left you that for a moment I wasn't sure it was you. Well, this is luck, and it is quite a fluke, too. I was getting heartily sick of doing duty at that wretched fort where one day was just like another, and there was nothing in the world to do except cleaning one's traps when a letter arrived from the governor. I told you the old boy was sure to give in sooner or later, and he sent me money to get my discharge and take me home. I was just going to the commanding officer to make my application when Rutherford rode into camp. It was evidently something very important, for his horse fell dead as he drew rein. So, I waited to hear the news and found that our troop was ordered to mount instantly to ride to the rescue of a party of settlers and cowboys who were besieged by the Indians. You may guess I dropped my letter into my pocket and said nothing about it. We have done a good deal of scouting and had two or three paltry skirmishes with the Indians, but nothing worth talking about. And this seemed, from what Rutherford said, to be likely to be a regular battle. And so, you see, here I am. It has been a jolly wind-up for my soldiering. And, and to think that you should be one of the party, we have ridden something like 300 miles to rescue. Now, tell me all about yourself. At this moment, the trumpet to saddle sounded. I will tell you as we ride along, Hugh said. I don't suppose there will be any particular order kept on our way back. Five minutes later, the whole party were cantering down the valley. They did not draw rein until late in the afternoon, and then halted on the banks of the Canadian. A strong cordon of sentries was posted that night, but there were no signs of Indians, and the next day the party reached one of the ranch stations. During the two days' march and at the camp, Hugh and Luscombe had kept together, the latter having obtained permission from his officer to fall out of the ranks upon his telling him that one of the cowboys was an old friend who had come with him from Europe. I shall be off in a month or two, Luscombe said when they parted that evening. I expect there are formalities to be gone through here just as there are in England. You are quite sure there is no chance of your going home with me? Quite sure. I have another three years to stop out here yet, and then I can go back and claim my own. I wrote to Randolph, my trustee, you know, to tell him I am alive and well and very glad that I did not kill that uncle of mine and saying that I shall return when I am of age, but not before. What do you mean to do, Luscombe? I am going to settle down, Luscombe said. I can tell you a year's work as trooper in one of these Yankee forts is about enough to make a man sick of soldiering. I have eaten the bread of adversity, and very hard bread it is, too, 
and there is mighty little butter on it. I am going in for fatted calf when I go back, and am quite prepared to settle down into a traditional squire to look after fat beeves, become interested in turnips, and to be a father to my people. Well, anyhow, Hugh, you will let me know when you come back to England. You know my address, and as soon as you have kicked that uncle of yours out and have squared matters generally, you must come straight to me. You will be sure of the heartiest welcome. The governor is a capital old boy, and if he did cut up Rusty, the wonder is he didn't do it long before. My mother is a dear old lady, and the girls, there are two of them, are first-rate girls, and the youngest, by the way, is just about the right age for you. She was 14 when I came away. Hugh laughed. I shall very likely bring home an Indian squaw or a Mexican, so we won't build on that, Luscombe. But when I go back to England, you shall hear of me, and I accept the invitation beforehand. On the following morning, the party broke up. The troops started back for the fort. Steve Rutherford and the cowboys rode for a time southwest and then worked their way over the foothills and came down into the plains of Texas, and after a week's travel returned to the village from which they had started. It had already begun to rise from its ruins. Wagon loads of lumber had been brought up from below, and there was no lack of willing hands from other scattered settlements to aid in the work of rebuilding the houses. Little attention was paid to the party as they rode up from the plains, for it was not on that side that a watch had been kept up for their return. And indeed, the eyes of the survivors had almost ceased to turn towards the mountains, for hope had well nigh died out, and it had been regarded as certain that the whole party had been cut off and massacred by the Indians. As soon, however, as the news spread that there were women among the approaching troop, axes, saws, and hammers were thrown down, and there was a rush to meet them. The scene was an affecting one, as mothers clasped daughters and women embraced their husbands, whom they had never thought to see again. The cowboys were pressed to stay there for the night, but they refused as they were anxious to return to the ranch from which they had been absent more than three weeks. Fortunately, the busy season was almost over when they left, and they knew that there were enough hands on the ranch to look after the cattle during their absence. On the way back, Bronco Harry said to Hugh, I expect Hugh a good many of us will be getting our tickets before long. They don't keep on more than half their strength through the winter. What are you thinking of doing? If you would like to stop on, I'll speak to the boss. I reckon I shall have charge of an outfit this winter and can manage for you and Stumpy. Thank you very much, Bronco, but as I have told you often, I don't want to stop. I have had a season's life as a cowboy, but I have no idea of sticking to it and mean to have a try at something else. I intend to go back to England when I am 21. I have some property there and have no need to work. I got into a scrape at home with the man who is my guardian and don't care about turning up until he has no longer any authority over me. Well, you know your own business, Lightning. It is a pity, for in another year you would make one of the best hands on the plains. <laughs> if I were to stay for another year, I expect I should stay for good, Harry. It is a hard life, a terribly hard life, but it is a grand one for all that. There is nothing like it in the way of excitement, and I don't wonder that men who once take to it find it very difficult to settle down to anything else afterwards. Therefore, you see, it is just as well to stop before one gets too fond of it. I know I shall always look back upon this as the jolliest time of my life, and I am lucky to have gone through it without having been damaged by a cow, or having my neck broken by a bronco, or being shot by an Indian. Royce has made up his mind to go with me, and as soon as we get our discharge, we shall make our way to New Mexico, and perhaps down into Arizona, but of course that must depend upon other things. Upon reaching the station, they found that, as Harry had predicted, hands were already being discharged. The manager said, when they went to him and told him that they wished to leave, Well, I had intended to keep you both on for the winter, but, of course, if you wish to go, there is an end of it, and there are so many anxious to be kept on that a man in my position feels almost grateful to those who voluntarily afford vacancies. There were very hearty adieus between Hugh and Royce and Bronco Harry, Long Tom, and the others who had been their close companions for months. Then they mounted and rode off from the station. They had heard from a man who had just arrived that a large wagon train was on the point of starting from Decatur for Santa Fe. It was composed of several parties who had been waiting until a sufficient force was collected to venture across the Indian country. There were several wagon trains going with supplies for the troops stationed at the chain of forts along the line. Others had goods for Santa Fe, while a third was freighted with machinery and stores for mining enterprises farther south in New Mexico. It took Royce and Hugh a week to traverse the country to Decatur, and on arriving there they heard that the teams had started two days before. 
They waited a day at Decatur to buy a pack horse and the necessary stores for their journey, and then set out. In two days, they overtook the train, which consisted of 40 wagons. Learning which man had been selected as the leader of the party, they rode up to him. We're going to Santa Fe, Royce said. We are both good shots and hunters, and we propose to travel with you. We are ready to scout and bring in game if you will supply us with other food. That's a bargain, the man said briefly, by no means sorry at the addition of strength to the fighting force. I reckon you are in your grub. They say the engines are on the warpath. They are right enough there, Royce said. We've been engaged in a fight with a band of the Comanches who made a raid down on a little settlement named Gainsford, killed a score of settlers, and carried off five women. We got together a band from the ranch we were working on and went after them, and we had some pretty tough fighting before we got through. Well, you will just suit us, the man said. I hear pretty near all the tribes are up, but I doubt whether they will venture to attack a party like this. I don't think they will if we keep together and are cautious, Roy said. You have 40 wagons. That at two men to a wagon makes 80. That's so, the other agreed. And what with cooks and bosses and one thing and another, we mount up to pretty nigh 100, and of course every man has got a rifle along with him. That makes a strong party, Roy said. And with the advantage you will have of fighting from the cover of the wagons, I don't think the Redskins would dare to attack you. We've got a pack animal along with us, as you see, and our blankets and things. We will hitch him to the tail of one of the wagons. The man nodded. I've got four teams here of my own, he said, and a spare man who cooks and so on for my outfit. So you may as well join in with that. They are the last four wagons in the line. The journey occupied six weeks. They kept it first up the west fork of the Trinity River, crossing a patch of heavily timbered country. Then they struck the main fork of the Brazos River and followed it for some distance, then took the track across to the Rio Pecos. It led them by a toilsome journey across an elevated and arid country without wood or water, save that which they obtained at the headwaters of the Double Mountain River, and from four small streams which united lower down to form the north fork of the Colorado River. From this point, until they reached the Pecos, a distance of over a hundred miles, there was no water. At ordinary times, caravans would not have followed this route, but would have kept far to the north. But they would have been exposed to attacks by the Comanches and Utes, so, in spite of their strength, they thought it prudent to follow the longer and safer route. With a view to this journey across the desert, each wagon carried an empty hogshead slung behind it. These were filled at the last springs, and the water, doled out sparingly, sufficed to enable the men and animals to subsist for the five days the journey occupied, although the allowance was so small that the sufferings of the cattle were severe. Up to this time, Hugh and Royce had succeeded almost daily in bringing a couple of stags into camp, but game was scarce in this parched and arid region, where not only water was wanting, but grass was scanty in the extreme, and the only sustenance for deer was the herbage of the scattered bushes. They therefore rode with the caravan and aided it as far as they could. The wagons, which were of great size, were generally drawn by twelve oxen or mules, and in crossing the deep sand it was sometimes necessary to use the teams of two wagons to drag one over the sand hills. Sometimes even this failed to move them, and the mounted men fastened their ropes to the spokes of the wheels and so helped to get the wagons out of the holes into which they had sunk. I would rather run the risks of a fight with the Indians, Hugh said to Royce on the last day of their journey across the plain, than have to perform this frightful journey. The heat is simply awful, and I feel as if I could drink a bucket of water. You will get plenty of water tonight, Hugh. The Pecos is a good big river. I believe the animals smell it already. Look how hard they are pulling. The drivers crack their whips and shout as usual, but the beasts are doing their best without that. We've been very lucky that we've had no sandstorms or anything to delay us and confuse us as to the track. Well, we are over the worst of the journey now. Except the Guadalupe Pass, there ain't much trouble between the Pecos and El Paso. Once there, we are on the Rio Grande all the way up to Santa Fe. Towards the afternoon, the ground became harder, and the animals quickened their pace almost to a trot, straining at the ropes with heaving flanks while their tongues hanging out and their bloodshot eyes showed how they were suffering. An hour before sunset, a shout broke from the men as, on ascending a slight rise, the river lay before them. The instant they reached its bank and the animals were loosed, they rushed in a body into the stream and plunged their nostrils deeply into the water, while the men, ascending the banks a short distance, lay down at the edge of the stream and satisfied their thirst. Five minutes later, all had stripped and were enjoying a bath. Hugh had been much struck with the difference between the Teamsters and the Cowboys. 
the former did not wear the chaparajos or leather overalls with fringed seams or the bright silk neck handkerchiefs or flat-brimmed hats of the cowboys. Their attire was sober rather than bright. They wore soft hats with slouched brims and great cowhide boots. There was none of that dashing, reckless air that characterized the cowboys or the quick alertness that showed the readiness to cope with any emergency that might occur. Nor in the camp at night was there any trace of the light-hearted gaiety which showed itself in song, laughter, and dance in the gatherings round the cowboys' fires. They were for the most part silent and moody men, as if the dull, monotonous labor in which they were engaged, and the months of solitary journeying, with nothing to break the silence save the cracking of the whips and the shouts of encouragement to the animals, had left their mark upon them. Hugh and Royce agreed cordially that, with all its dangers and its unmeasured toil, they would infinitely prefer the life of a cowboy, short as it might be, to that of a teamster, even with the prospect of acquiring a competence upon which to settle down in old age. Two days' halt was made on the banks of the Pecos to rest the foot-sore animals. Then the journey was recommenced, the river crossed at a shallow ford, and its banks followed until, after three days' journey, a small stream running in from the west was reached. Hence the route lay due west to El Paso. The country was flat until they reached the Guadalupe range of hills, which they crossed by a winding and difficult pass, each wagon being taken up by three teams. Then, skirting the Alamos Hills, they crossed the Sierra Hueco by the pass of the same name, which was far easier than that of Guadalupe, and then one long day's march took them down to Fort Bliss, which stands on the Rio Grande, facing the town of El Paso. They had now arrived at the borders of civilization. Mexican villages and towns and United States posts were scattered thickly along the course of the river, all the way from El Paso up to Santa Fe. Where do you think it'd do, young fella? The head of the party asked Hugh as they sat by the fire of the encampment a short distance out of El Paso. You see, we shall kind of break up here. I'll go with my teams to the forts along the river and then strike out east to the outlying post. About half my freight is ammunition and such like. Well, then pretty nigh half the wagons go up to the mines. They have powder, tools, and machinery. One or two stay here. They bring hardware and store goods of all sorts for this town. The rest go up to Santa Fe. Now, what are you thinking of doing? You can make up your mind to stay here, or you can go up to Santa Fe. You told me you had a fancy for joining some prospecting party and going out west into Arizona. I doubt whether you will find anyone much bent on that job at present, seeing as how the engines is stirring. Though I don't know that makes much difference, seeing they is always again anyone going into what they calls their country. Anyhow, the miners will all have to work with a pick in one hand and a rifle in the other. You've got the Apaches here, and they're worse than the Comanches. The Comanches have had to deal with western hunters and pioneers, and know that there ain't much to be got out of them but lead, so beyond stealing cattle, they've gotten to the way of being mostly quiet, though now and again they break out, just as they have at present. Now, the Apache has had to deal all along with Mexicans, and he has pretty good reason for thinking he is much better fighter than the white man. He has been raiding on the Mexican villages for hundreds of years, burning and killing and carrying off their women and gals, and I guess there is pretty good sprinkling of Mexican blood in his veins, though that don't make him better or worse as far as I know. Still, take them together. They are the savagest and hardest tribe of redskins on this continent. However... If you like to go prospecting among our hills and to run the risk of losing your scalp, that is your business. But if you do, this is the place to start from and not Santa Fe. There's gold pretty nigh everywhere in the Valley of the Gila, and that lies a bit to the northwest from here. At any rate, it seems to me that this is the place that you are most likely to fall in with the party starting out. But let me give you a warning, lad. You will find this town is pretty nigh full of gold miners, and you won't find one of them who won't tell you that he knows of some place that's a sartin fortune up among the hills. Now, don't you believe them. Don't you go and put your money into any job like that. If you find a party being got up and others think it is good enough to join, of course you can chip in. But don't you go and find the money for the whole show. There is no fear of that, you laughed. I had about five and twenty pounds when I went on to the ranch, and I have got that and six months' pay in my belt. That won't go far towards fitting out an expedition. No, it won't, the teamster agreed. It will be enough for you to be able to chip in with the others, but, as you say, not to stand the whole racket. Well, what do you think? I am very much obliged to you for your advice, Hugh said, and I think we can't do better than stay about here for a bit at any rate. What do you say, Royce? It is all one to me, Royce replied, but there's no doubt that El Paso is as good a place as any, if not better, for looking around. 
"'Then that is settled, Bill. "'And to tell you the truth, "'I have had pretty nigh enough riding for the present "'and shan't be sorry for a fortnight's rest.' "'Same here,' Bill said. "'I feel as if I was getting part of the horse "'and should like to get about on foot for a bit "'so as to feel that I hadn't quite lost the use of my legs.' "'Accordingly, the next morning, "'they bade goodbye to their comrades of the last two months "'and, mounting, rode into El Paso. "'It was a town of some size "'and purely Mexican in its features and appearance. "'The inhabitants almost all belonged to that nationality, "'but in the street were a considerable number "'of red-shirted miners and teamsters.' Hugh and his companions rode up to one of the principal haciendas and handed over the three horses to a lounging Mexican. They have been fed this morning, Royce said. We will come in and give them some corn in two hours. I will see after Prince, Hugh said, patting his horse's neck. Don't you be afraid that I am going to leave you to the care of strangers. We have been together too long for that old boy. They then went into the hotel and ordered a room and breakfast. I don't care much for this Mexican stuff with its oil and garlic. "'Roy said as they had finished the meal. "'Don't you? I call it first rate. "'After living on fried beef and broiled beef for over a year, "'it is a comfort to get hold of vegetables. "'These beans were delicious, and the coffee is a treat.' "'It isn't bad for one meal,' Royce admitted reluctantly. "'But you'll get pretty sick of Mexican cookery after a bit "'and long for a chunk of plain beef hot from the fire. "'Perhaps I shall,' Hugh laughed. "'But I think it will be some little time first. "'Now let us take a stroll round the town.' It was all new to Hugh. He had seen the Mexican women in their native dress in the villages among the hills, but here they indulged in much more finery than the peasant girls. The poblenas were all dressed in gay colors, with a scarf or rebezo over their heads, with gold pins and ornaments in their glossy black hair, and with earrings, necklaces, and generally bracelets of the same metal. No small share of a peasant's wealth is exhibited on the persons of his womankind. They wore short skirts, generally of red or green, trimmed with rows of black braid, while a snow-white petticoat below and a white shimmy set partly hidden by a gay handkerchief over the shoulders completed the costume. They were almost all barefooted, but Hugh observed that their feet and ankles were exceedingly small and well-formed, as were their hands and plump brown arms. Here and there were a good many of the upper-class half shrouded in black mantles, wearing the Spanish mantilla, worn so as partly to conceal the face, though it needed but the slightest movement to draw it aside when they wished to recognize anyone they met. Most of these were on their way to a church, whose bell was pealing out a summons and carried their mass book in one hand and a fan in the other. Many a look of admiration was bestowed by the merry peasant girls upon Hugh as he walked along. He was now eighteen and had attained his full height, and his life on horseback gave an easy and lissom appearance to his tall, powerful figure. His work among the cattle had given to his face something of the keen, watchful expression that characterizes the cowboys, but not to a sufficient extent to materially affect the frank, pleasant look that was his chief characteristic. His gray eyes and the light brown hair with the slightest tinge of gold in it, typical of the hardy North Country race, were very attractive to the dark-skinned Mexicans. He and his companions had both donned their best attire before leaving camp, and this differed but slightly from that of the Mexican vaqueros, and though sufficiently gay to attract general attention elsewhere, passed unnoticed at El Paso. The western cowboy was not an unusual figure there, for many of those discharged during the winter were in the habit of working down upon the New Mexican ranches and taking temporary employment with the native cattle raisers, by whom their services were much valued, especially where the ranches were in the neighborhood of those worked by white cowboys. These and any disputes as to cattle with the Mexican vaqueros were accustomed to carry matters with a high hand. But the white cowboys in Mexican service were just as ready to fight for their employers' rights as were those on the American ranches, and the herds were safe from depredation when under their charge. There were many priests in the streets, and numerous as they were, they were always saluted with the deepest respect by the peasant women. It is wonderful how much women think of their priests, Royce observed philosophically. Back east, it used to make me pretty well sick when I was a young chap to hear them go on about their ministers. But these Mexican women go a lot farther. There is nothing they wouldn't do for these fat padres. No, but they are not all fat, Royce, Hugh said. I acknowledge they look for the most part plump and well-fed, and upon the best of terms with themselves, as well they may be, seeing how much they are respected. They have got a pretty easy life, I reckon, Royce said contemptuously. They have got to say mass two or three times a day, sit in a box listening to the women's confessions, and fatten upon their gifts and offerings. At any rate, Royce, the people here are religious. 
See, there are as many peasants as peasant women going into that church. Whatever may be said about it, religion goes for a good deal more in a Catholic country than in a Protestant. It is a pity there is not more religion among the cowboys. How are we to get it? Royce protested. Once or twice a year, a minister may arrive at a camp and preach, but that's about all. We always give him a fair show, and if any feller were to make a muss, it would be worse for him. I don't say as cowboys don't use pretty hard language among themselves, but I will say this, that if a minister or a woman comes to camp, they will never hear a swear word if they stop there a week. No, sir, cowboys know how to behave when they like, and a woman might go through the ranches from end to end in Texas without being insulted. I know that, Royce. The point is, if they can go without using what you call swear words when a woman is among them, why can't they always do so? It is all very fine to talk, Hugh, but when you get on a buck and bronco that sends you flying about ten yards through the air and you come down kerplump, I never seed a man yet as would pick himself up and speak as if he were in a church. No, sir, it's not in human nature. When they got back to the hotel, Hugh observed that questioning glances were cast at them by several men who were lounging about the steps. Royce observed it also. "'What have those fellows got in their heads, I wonder?' he said. "'Do they reckon we are two bad, bold men who have been holding up some Mexican village, or do they take us for horse thieves? There is something wrong, Hugh, you bet.' "'They certainly didn't look friendly, Royce, though I am sure I don't know what it is about. You haven't been winking at any of their women, have you?' Go along with your voice, laughed, as if any of them would look at a little chap like me while I am walking along of you. If there has been any winking, it's you as has done it. I am quite innocent, Royce, I assure you. Still, there is something wrong. Well, let us go and see that the horses are fed. There were five or six men in the yard. They were talking excitedly together when Hugh and his companion came out of the hotel, but they were at once silent and stood looking at them as they crossed the yard and went into the stable. There's something wrong, Royce repeated. If my horse were as good as yours, Hugh, I should say let's settle up quietly and ride out and make a bolt, but they would overtake me in no time. That would never do, Royce. I don't know what their suspicions are, but they would be confirmed if we were to try to escape, and if they overtook us, the chances are they wouldn't give us much time for explanations. You are right there, Hugh. The Mexicans hates the whites. They know that one of us could lick any three of them, and it riles them pretty considerable. They don't give a white man much show if they get their hands on him. Well, it is no use worrying about it, Royce. I suppose we shall hear sooner or later what it is all about. Passing through the hotel, they took their seats at some tables placed in the shade in front of the house, and there sat smoking and talking for some time. If those fellows round the door keep on looking at us much longer, Royce said, I shall get up and ask him what they mean. Don't do that, Royce. It would only bring on a fight. That is no use here. Well, Royce said doggedly. I haven't got to sit here to be stared at, and some of them fellas is going to get wiped out if they go on at it. We are sure to hear before long, Royce. See, there is a knot of four or five fellows in uniform at the other end of the square. I suppose that they are a sort of policemen. I have seen them looking this way. You will see they are going to arrest us presently, and then, I suppose, we shall hear all about it. I wish we had Bronco Harry and the rest of our outfit here, Royce said. We would clear out the whole town. Half an hour later, there was a clatter of horses' hoofs, and two gentlemen, followed by half a dozen Mexican vaqueros, rode into the square and made straight for the hotel. Simultaneously, the guardians of the peace moved across the square, and there was a stir among the loungers at the entrance to the hotel. The affair is coming to a crisis, Royce. One of the Mexicans was an elderly man, the other a lad 17 or 18 years old. The latter dismounted and entered the hotel. In two minutes, he reappeared and spoke to the other, who also dismounted, and after a word or two with one of the men belonging to the hotel and a short conversation with the leader of the party of civil guards, advanced to the table at which Hugh and Royce were sitting. He saluted them as they rose to their feet. Hugh returned the salutation. Senors, he said courteously, in very fair English, you have, I understand, just arrived here, having accompanied a wagon train across the deserts from Texas. It is perfectly true, senor, he replied. Is there anything unusual in our doing so? By no means, the Mexican said. The matter that concerns me is that one of you is riding a horse which belonged to my son, Don Estefan Perales. You mean the bay? The Mexican made a gesture of assent. I purchased that horse at McKinney, a small town northeast of Texas. May I ask who you purchased it from? Certainly, senor. It must have passed from the hands of your son before it was offered for sale to me. I bought it from two men whom I had never seen before. 
a little crowd had gathered behind the Mexican, and at this answer there were exclamations of, a likely story that, and death to the horse thieves. Two men in mining costume, the one a tall, powerfully built man some fifty years old, the other small and of slight figure with snow-white hair who had just strolled up, separated themselves from the rest and ranged themselves by Hugh's side, the big man saying in Mexican, Softly, senores, softly. You ain't neither judges nor jury on this case, and me and my mate is going to see fair play. There is no intention, senor, of doing anything unfair, the Mexican said. The matter is a simple one. These strangers have just ridden in here with a horse belonging to my son. He started from here with three servants and a party going to Texas. This was upwards of 18 months ago. He had business at New York. His intention was to spend a few weeks in Texas hunting, then to proceed to the nearest railway station and take the train to New York. From the time he started, we have never heard from him. Some members of the party he accompanied have long since returned. It seems that he accompanied them until they had passed the Badlands and then left them to carry out his intention of hunting. We have never heard of him since. He certainly has never arrived at New York. And now that these strangers arrive here with his horse, which was recognized as soon as it entered the stables, I have a right to inquire how they obtained it. Surely, senor, Hugh said. The men from whom I bought it were, as I said, strangers. They were two very doubtful-looking characters, and as they appeared very anxious to sell the horse and were willing to part with it considerably under its value, my opinion was that undoubtedly they had not become possessed of it honestly. My friend here was with me at the time, and the only terms upon which I would purchase it and a pack horse they also had to sell were that they should give me a formal receipt signed in the presence of the sheriff and judge, in order that, should I at any time come across the owner of the animal, I should be in a position to prove that I at least had come by it honestly. That receipt I have here. And taking a small leather case from his pocket, he produced the receipt. These are the signatures, senor, and the official stamps of the writers, and you will see that they testify also to their personal knowledge of me as a resident of the town. I may add that it is certain that, had I been an accomplice of the thieves, I should have taken good care not to bring the horse to a locality where he would be at once recognized. The Mexican glanced through the paper. That is perfectly satisfactory, senor, and I must apologize for having for a moment entertained suspicions of you. Explain this, Carlos, he said to his son. I would have further talk with these gentlemen. The young Mexican translated in his own language the effect of what had passed, and the little crowd speedily dispersed, several having walked away as soon as the two miners sided with the accused, as a fray with four determined men armed with revolvers was not to be lightly entered upon. The miners were also turning away when Hugh said to the Mexican, Excuse me a moment, senor. Thank you greatly, he went on, turning to the miners, for siding with us. We are strangers here. Will you let us see you again and have a talk with you? At present, as you see, this gentleman who has lost his son, who has most probably been murdered by these horse thieves, wants to question me. Do me the favor to come in this evening and drink a bottle of wine with us, when we can again thank you for your aid. There are no thanks due, the bigger of the two men said. Me and my mate know nothing of the affair, but seeing two of our own color facing a lot of these Mexicans, we naturally ranged up alongside of you to see fair play. But as you're strangers and we have nothing particular to do, I don't mind if we come in and have a talk this evening, eh, mate? The little man nodded, and the two walked off together. Hugh then turned to the Mexican. Now, senor, we are at your service. Senors, he said courteously, my name is Don Ramon Perales. My hacienda lies three miles away. This is scarcely a place for quiet conversation. I am anxious to learn all particulars that you can give me as to the men from whom you bought the horse. May I ask if you would mount your horses and ride back with me? With pleasure, senor, Hugh said. Our time is entirely our own, and I can readily understand your anxiety to hear all you can about this matter. End of chapter 15. Read by Dory Smith. Chapter 16 of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, A Mining Expedition. In a few minutes, Hugh and Royce remounted and joined the two Mexican gentlemen and set out with the party of vaqueros riding behind them. You came in with quite a strong force, Don Ramon, Hugh said, smiling. It might have been necessary, the Mexican replied. I could not tell with whom I had to deal. 
our guard do not care very much about risking their skins, especially when it is a question of Texan cowboys who have, if you will excuse my saying so, a terrible reputation and can use their pistols with a skill that is extraordinary. I could not guess that I had to do with gentlemen. There is nothing that way about me, senor, Roy said abruptly. I am a cowboy or a teamster or a miner or anything that comes to hand, but nary a claim to be a gentleman. My friend is a good fellow, senor, in every way, Hugh said, and is my staunch and true friend. I myself am an Englishman who has come out to enjoy the hunting and the rough life of the plains of the West for a few years before settling down at home. And now, senor, the Mexican said with a bow, will you let me begin to question you, for I am full of anxiety as to my unfortunate son. I feared before that he was lost to us. I fear now even more than before, for I am sure that he would never have parted with his horse, which he had reared from a colt and was much attached to. These men from whom you bought it, were they known in that locality? No, he replied. Wherever they came from, they did not belong to that corner of Texas, for neither the judge nor the sheriff had ever seen them before. Had they known that they were bad characters, they would have arrested them and held them until an owner was found for the horse. But as they knew nothing against them, they did not feel justified in doing so. Will you describe them to me? The Mexican said. They were men of between 30 and 40. From their attire, they might have been hunters. They were dressed a good deal like your vaqueros. They wore chaparajos with red sashes around their waist and flannel shirts. They had jackets with silver buttons, which you don't see much among our cowboys on the plains, and broad, soft felt hats. I should say that one was a half-breed, that is to say, half Mexican, half American. Both had black mustaches and what I should call hang-dog faces. I have no doubt from your description, Don Ramon said. They were two men who joined the caravan a day or two before my son left it. These men said they were hunters, and I was told that my son engaged them to accompany him while he was hunting, to act as guides, and show him the best places for game. They were described to me by some of the party that returned here, and I feared at the time that if evil had befallen him, it was through them. Now that you tell me they sold you his horse, I feel but too certain this was so. They seem to have ridden fast and far. Their own horses and the bay were in fair condition, senor, but the pack horse was very poor. The men were evidently in great haste to get away, and I should judge from this that if, as you fear, they murdered your son and his three servants, they probably did it at the last camping place before they arrived at McKinney. Had they done it when far out on the plains, there would have been no good reason why they should have been in so much haste. But if it had been but a short distance away, they might have feared that someone might find the bodies and organize a pursuit at once. Why should they have delayed so long if their intention was murder? the younger Mexican asked. That I cannot say, Don Carlos. They may have fallen in with other hunters after leaving the caravan, and these may have kept with them all the time they were out on the plains, and they may have had no opportunity of carrying out their designs till the party separated. Or, again, your brother's attendants might have been suspicious of them and may have kept up too vigilant a watch for them to venture on an attack before. But this watch may have been relaxed when the journey was just at an end, and it seemed to them that their fears were unfounded. That is the most likely explanation, Don Ramon said. They were three picked men. Two of them were hunters, the other my son's body servant. It is likely enough that the hunters would have kept alternate watch at night had they suspected these fellows. Those two were to have remained in charge of the horses at the town where my son took rail and to await his return there. The other man was to accompany him to New York. My son had an ample supply of gold for his expenses, and I fear it was that rather than the horse that attracted the scoundrels. They were by this time approaching a large and handsome building, standing in extensive grounds. As they halted before it, a number of peons ran out and took the horses. Prince had quickened his pace as he neared the house and had given a joyful neigh as of recognition. When he alighted, the horse, as usual, laid his muzzle on his shoulder to receive a caress before turning away, and then, without waiting for one of the peons to take his rein, walked away toward the stables. I see he is fond of you, senor. You have been a kind master to him. I love horses, you said, and Prince, as I have called him, has been my companion night and day for eighteen months. We have hunted together and roped in cattle and fought Indians and divided out last crust together. Don Ramon led the way into the house and then into a room where an elderly lady and two young ones were sitting. They rose as he entered. What news, Ramon? the elderly lady asked. Such news as there is is bad, Maria. These caballeros, 
Don Hugh Tunstall, and he hesitated and looked at Royce, with whose name he was not acquainted. Bill Royce, without any Don, the cowboy put in. The Mexican repeated the name. Have been good enough to ride over here with me in order that you, as well as I, might question them as to what they know of our son. Unhappily, they know little. We were not misinformed. Don Hugh has indeed our son's horse, but he bought it, as he has proved to me, from two strangers who tally exactly with the description we have received of the two hunters who left the caravan with our son. I feared all along that these men were at the bottom of whatever might have befallen Estefan. I fear now that there is no doubt whatever about it. Caballeros, this is my wife, Donna Maria Perales. These are my two daughters, Dolores and Nina. For an hour, Hugh and his companion remained answering questions of Donna Perales. Then Hugh rose, feeling that the ladies would be glad to be alone in their grief, for the confirmation of their fears respecting Don Estefan had brought their loss back to them freshly. Don Ramon and his son accompanied them to the door. I pray you, the former said, that if at any time you come upon the villains, you give them in custody. I and my son will make the journey to appear against them, however far it may be. You need not trouble on that score, Roy said. If we meet them, I warrant you we can manage their business without any bother of judge or jury. They will have a cowboy trial, and after the evidence Hugh and I can give, you may be sure that a rope will very soon settle their affair. I must ask you, Don Ramon, Hugh said, to lend me a horse back to the town and to send a vaquero with me to bring it back. But why, sir? the Mexican asked in surprise. You have your own horse. No, senor, Prince is not mine. He was your son's and is yours. A man who buys stolen property is liable to lose it if he meets the proper owner. And when I bought Prince for half his value, I knew that I was running that risk. No, senor Englishman, I do not say that a man who has lost his horse has not the right to reclaim it wherever he may find it. That is, if he happens to be in a place where the law is respected, or if not, if he happens to be with the strongest party. But in the present case, I could not think of depriving you of the horse. It is evident that he has found a good master, and that you stand in his affections, just as my son did. Besides, if you will pardon my saying so, the horse is more to you than it is to me. There are many thousands of horses running wild on my estates, and although my son used to assert that there was not one which was equal to his horse, there are numbers that are but little inferior, for our horses are famous. They are mustangs crossed with pure Arab blood, which my grandfather had selected and sent over to him, regardless of cost. Pray, therefore, keep the bay. May it carry you long and safely. It will be a real pleasure to my wife and myself to know that poor Estefan's favorite horse is in such good hands. I have also, he said courteously to Royce, taken the liberty of ordering my peons to change the saddle of the horse you rode to one more worthy of being a companion to the bay. It is of no use for one man to be well mounted if his comrade does not bestride a steed of similar swiftness. Hugh and Royce warmly thanked Don Ramon for his kindness. The horses were brought round, and that of Royce fully bore out the commendation of the Mexican. We hope to see you again tomorrow, Don Ramon said as they mounted. You will always be welcome guests here. And you will not forget, Don Carlos said in a low tone, if you ever meet those men. That has been a fortunate adventure, Royce said as they rode off. I have often wondered whether we should ever fall upon the original owner of your horse and picture to myself that we might have a bad time of it if we did. It isn't everyone who would have accepted that receipt of yours as proof. No, I always felt that myself, Royce. Well, that sorrel of yours is a splendid animal and really worthy to go with Prince. I often wished you had a mount as good as mine, for my sake as well as your own, for there is no doubt of the truth of what he said. When two friends are riding together, their pace is only that of the slowest horse. That is so, Royce agreed. So there is some Arab blood in them. I have often talked over the bay in the camps. We all agreed we had never seen so good a Mustang. There are good Mustangs, but they are never a match for a really first-rate state's horse, and yet we could not see any signs of such a cross in Prince. He were Mustang, but there seemed more whipcord and wire about him than a Mustang has. I have heard say that the Mustangs are the descendants of Spanish barbs, and that the barbs were Moorish horses. Yes, that is so, Royce. The barb is related to the Arab, but is not, I believe, of such pure blood. It is a coarser animal, and if Don Ramon's grandfather brought over some pure Arabs of first-rate strain, they would, no doubt, greatly improve the Mustangs. Well, Hugh, 
If we ever do meet those two murdering villains, I reckon their chances of getting away from us ain't worth mentioning. The reception on their return to the hotel was very different to that they had before experienced. They had been visitors at Don Ramon's hacienda, and Don Ramon was the richest proprietor in the district of El Paso. After they had finished supper that evening and were enjoying coffee and cigars at a table placed with others in a garden behind the hotel, the two miners who had stood by them in the morning came up and took seats beside them. You had a pretty rough welcome this morning at El Paso, the big man said. But, by the way, I do not know what to call you. My own name is Sim. I am generally known as Surly Sim. My friend's name is Frank. I generally call him the doctor. My name is Bill, Roy said, and out on the plane, the boys call me Stumpy, which don't need any explanation. My mate's name is Hugh, and he's got the name of Lightning. Ah, and why is that, may I ask, the white-haired little man said. Well, it is because of one of his accomplishments, doctor. He's got the knack of drawing a pistol that sharp that almost before you see his hand move, you're looking down the tube of a pistol. A very useful accomplishment, the little man remarked, always supposing that it is not used too often and that it is only used in self-defense. I'm a peaceful man myself, he went on, and have a horror of the use of firearms. His companion laughed. Now you know that is so, Sim, the little man said earnestly. Well, doctor, I don't go for to say that you are quarrelsome, and if anyone said so in my hearing, I should tell him you were a liar. But for a peaceable man, doctor, and I don't deny as you were peaceable, I don't know as there is a man in the mining regions who has used his weapon oftener than you have. But always on the side of peace, Sim, the little man said earnestly. Please to remember, always on the side of peace. Yes, in the same way that a New York policeman uses his club, doctor. Well, I can assure you I don't often use what you call my accomplishment, Hugh said. I practice it so that I may be able to defend my life if I am attacked, but except in a fight with a band of Comanches, I have only once had occasion to draw my pistol. And he weakened, Sim asked. Yes, I had the drop of him. There was nothing else for him to do. And what are you going to do at El Paso? You're too abrupt, Sim, much too abrupt, the little man said deprecatingly. Not at all, doctor. If it is anything they don't want to tell, they won't tell it. If it isn't, we may be useful to them. We have no particular object in view, Hugh said. I am an Englishman, but not a rich Englishman who comes out to buy ranches or to speculate in mines. But I have come rather to pass three or four years in seeing life on the western plains than to make money. I worked for six months in McKinney, had three or four months hunting, and then worked six months as a cowboy. And I thought that, for a change, I should like to come this way and see something of mining adventure in New Mexico or Arizona. My mate here has been with me for nearly two years and has thrown in his fortune with mine. There's adventure enough, and more than enough, in mining down there in Arizona. The doctor and I have been at it for some years. We haven't made a penny, but we have saved our scalps, so we may be considered lucky. I was told, Hugh went on, that El Paso was the most central place to come to. My idea was that I might find some party setting out on a prospecting expedition and that I might be able to join it. It ain't a good time for prospecting expeditions, Sim said. Even on the upper heel of the mining camps is all on guard, knowing that any day the Apaches may be down on them, and it would want a man to be a wonderful fond of gold for him to go out prospecting down in Arizona. I don't care much for gold, Hugh laughed, though I don't say I should object to take my share if we hit on a rich load. I should go for the sake of the excitement and to see the life. Well, at other times you might find any number of people here in El Paso who would be glad enough to take you out on such an expedition, the doctor said. You ask the first man you meet, Mexican or white, and he will tell you he knows of a mine and will take you to it if you will fit out an expedition. You are her exceptions to the rule, doctor. No, I don't say that, the doctor replied, though his companion gave a growling protest. Oh, yes, we know of a mine, he went on, not heeding the growl. At least we believe we do, which is, I suppose, as much as anybody can say. But we are like the rest. We say that it is better to stay at El Paso and keep our scalps on, even if we are poor, than to go and throw away our lives in looking for a mine. We've been out working for the last six months on a mine in the Gila Valley on shares with six others. We weren't doing so badly, but the Mexicans who were working for us got scared and wouldn't stay, so we've given it up and come down here. Some day or other, when things settle down again, I suppose the mine will be worked, but it won't be by us. We're looking out for someone who will buy our shares, but I don't suppose anyone will give five dollars for them, and they would be right. The thing paid in our hands, but it wouldn't pay in Mexicans. 
They are poor, shiftless creatures and have no idea of hard work. We should have given it up anyhow, even without these Indian troubles, which don't make much difference, for the Apaches are always ready to come down when they see a chance. It is always war between them and the whites. But we were there six months, and six months are about the outside Sim and I ever stop anywhere. When you do go prospecting, do you often get any hints from the Indians as to where gold is to be found? Never, Sim Hallett said. The engines are too lazy to work themselves, and they know that when the whites get hold of gold, they pour down in numbers. I believe they do know often where there are loads. I don't see how they can be off knowing it, for a redskin is always keeping his eyes on the move. Nothing escapes him, and it would be strange if, wandering about as they do, and knowing every foot of their country, they didn't notice gold when it is there to see. Besides, they've got tales handed down from father to son. In old times, they had gold ornaments and such like, but you never see them now. They know well enough that such things would draw the whites. Sometimes a redskin will tell a white who has done him some great service where there is a load, gold or silver or copper, but it don't happen often. Besides, most of the times the place lies right in the heart of their country, and for all the good it is, it might as well be in the middle of the sea. Of course, if it was gold and the metal was found in nuggets, and a horse load or two could be got in a month, it might be done, but not when it comes to settling there and sinking shafts and mining. That can't be done until the Apaches are wiped out. But are there such places as that, Sim? Well, there might be, but I've never seen them. The doctor and me have struck it rich many a time, but not as rich as that. Still, I reckon there are places where the first comer might gather a big pile if the Redskins would but let him alone for a month. I suppose you are absent some time on one of these expeditions. Do prospectors generally go on foot or horseback? They, in general, takes a critter apiece and two others to carry grub and a pick and shovel. Sometimes they go two together, but more often one goes by itself. In course where two men knows each other and can trust each other, two is kind of handier than one. We shouldn't like to work alone, should we, Doc? But then, you see, we have been twelve years together. Sometimes a man finds his own outfit. Sometimes he goes to a trader in a town. And if he is known to be a good miner and a straight man, the storekeeper will give him a sack of flour and a side of bacon and such other things as are required, and then they go partners in what is found. Sometimes this goes on for months, sometimes for years. Sometimes the trader loses his money, sometimes he makes a fortune. You see, there are plenty of places as ain't in what you may call the Indian country, but somehow or other it do seem as if the Redskins had just been put down where the best places is, so as to prevent the gold being dug. In Arizona, some big finds have been made, but nobody's any the richer for them. The Redskins is always on the lookout. Often an exploring party never comes back. Sometimes one or two come back with the news that the others have all been wiped out. But what with the awful country and the want of water and the certainty of having to fight and of sooner or later being surprised and scalped, there ain't many men as cares about following the thing up. I suppose you know of such places, Sim. Well, maybe we do, the miner said cautiously. Maybe we do, eh, doctor? The little man did not reply, but sat looking searchingly at Hugh. When he did speak, it was not in direct answer to the question. I like your face, young fellow, he said. It reminds me of one I have seen somewhere, though I can't say where. You look to me as if you were downright honest. I hope I am, Hugh said with a laugh. You may bet your boots on that, Bill Roy said. He is as straight a man as you will find in Texas. And you are out here, the other went on, part for pleasure, part just to see life, and part, I suppose, to make money if you see a chance. I have never thought much of making money, Hugh replied, although I should certainly have no objection if I saw a chance, but I have never thought of doing more than keeping myself. And he has been with you, you say, nigh two years, he nodded at Royce, and you can speak for him as he does for you? That I can, Hugh said warmly. We have worked together and hunted together. We have been mates in the same outfit, and we have fought the Comanches together, and I can answer for him as for myself. He gave up his work and went with me, not because there was any chance of making more money that way than any other, but because we liked each other. Well, Sim, the little man said, it seems to me that these two would make good mates for that job of ours. Well, doctor, you know I leave these things to you. I kind of feels that way myself towards them, and anyhow, I don't see as there can't be no harm in setting it afore them, seeing as there ain't no need to give them the indications. But I reckon there is too many about here to talk on a matter like that. Well, it comes to this, he went on, turning to Hugh. 
if you're disposed to make a giant expedition with us and ain't afeard neither of roughing it nor of redskins, you meet us tomorrow three miles outside of town on the south road and we will talk to you straight. That is just what would suit me, Hugh said. And you, Royce? It's all the same to me, Lightning. If you are for an expedition, you know you can count me in. Good night, then, Sim Hallett said, rising. We've sat here quite long enough talking together if we mean to do anything. I reckon there is a score of these Mexicans have been saying to themselves afore now, what can those two miners and them cowboys be a-talking together about? And when a Mexican begins to wonder, he begins to try and find out. So off we are. Three miles out on the south road at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. About half a mile past a village, you will see a stone cross by the road. There is a path turns off by it. You follow that, and you will come across us before you have gone two hundred yards. What do you think of it, Royce? Hugh asked when they were alone. Don't think nothing of it one way or the other. Most of them miners have got some tale or other. However, they seem to me straight men. I feel sure they are, Hugh said. The big one looks an honest fellow. I don't so much understand the little one, but evidently he is the head of the party. He is a curious little fellow with his white hair and gentle voice. He doesn't look strong enough for such a life as they lead, but I suppose he is able to do his share or they would never have been working twelve years together. At any rate, I came here to see something of life among the mines, and this seems as good a chance as we are likely to have. The next morning they breakfasted at seven, and at half past eight saddled their horses and rode out. They found their two companions of the previous night at the appointed place. As the miners saw them approaching, they turned off the path and preceded them to a Mexican hut, and there waited for them to come up. "'Good morning,' the doctor said as they dismounted. "'There's no fear of our being overheard up here. "'The Mexican who lives here has often been up with us among the hills "'and started for the town a quarter of an hour ago "'when we told him we had a rendezvous here. "'Now, if you will hitch your horses up and sit down on these maize stalks, "'we can talk comfortably. "'A year ago, when Sim and I were working in a gulch among the mountains, "'we heard a call in the distance.' We went to see what it was and found a man who had dropped down, just worn out and famished after he had given the cry that fetched us. He had been shot in four or five places, and we saw at once that his journey was nearly over. We carried him to our fire and brought him round, and did all we could for him for three weeks. Then he died. He told us he had been one of a party of six who had been prospecting in the hills west of the Lower Gila. One of them had learned from an Indian he had helped in some way of a place where the bed of a stream was full of gold. They found it, but the next morning they were attacked by the Apaches, who had, I expect, been following them all the time. Two of them were killed at once. The others got upon their horses and rode for it. Three of them were shot down, but this man was well mounted and got off, though they chased him for three days. He lost his way. His horse fell dead, but he struggled on until he saw the smoke of our fire and made us out to be whites. Before he died, he told us how the place could be found. He said there was no doubt about the gold, and he had three or four nuggets in his pockets, weighing two or three pounds each. He said he had lots of bigger ones, but had chucked them all away to lighten his horse. Well, it is a long journey. It will take us all a month, I reckon, to get there. We cannot go straight. The Apaches would have us to a certainty, but must go north into the Moquis country, then down again from that side. We have been minded to try it ever since, but luck has been bad with us, and besides, two men wouldn't be enough for such a journey. It ain't every one Sim and I would care about going with, but we have both taken a fancy to you. We saw you stand up straight before that crowd of Mexicans. Besides, we know it wants good grit for that cowboy life. Now this is the offer we make. We have got two horses, and we can buy two pack horses, but we can't go further than that. You have got two out-and-out -out horses. We saw you ride in yesterday afternoon. You will want another pack horse, and you will have to provide the outfit, say, two bags of flour, two sides of bacon, ten pounds of tea, and a couple of gallons of spirits. Then there will be sugar and some other things. We shall also want a small tent. Now, if you like to join us on these terms, you can. There's plenty of gold for us all, but mind you, it will be no child's play. The journey from the Moquis country there will be terrible, and there is the chance, and a pretty big chance it is, I tell you, of a fight with the Redskins. We may never find the place. We've got pretty good indications, but it is not an easy matter to find a place among these mountains. Still, there it is. If you get there and back, you will each have a horse load of gold. If you don't, you will leave your bones there. What do you say to it? Hugh looked at Royce. I reckon we can take our chances if you can, the latter said. 
At any rate, mates, you will find as we can take our share in whatever comes. Then that is agreed, the doctor said. Now, about preparations. It will never do for you to be buying the things here, for if we were seen to start off together, we should be followed, sure enough. It would be guessed at once we had told you of something good. We must not be seen together again. We will get our pack horses and load up and go as if we were undertaking a job on our own account and camp up somewhere 20 miles away and stop there a week. After we have gone, you can get your outfit and move off and join us. Sim and I have been talking over whether it will be a good thing to take Jose, that's the man here, with us instead of buying baggage horses. He's got four beasts. He could ride one himself and the other three, with the one you have, would make up the number. Jose can be trusted. Besides, we should not tell him where we were going, but we should have to say it would be a long journey and a dangerous one. He is a widower with one child, and these horses are his only possession, and I think he would want their value put down before he started, say, $75 a piece for them in their saddles. That is $300. You wouldn't buy them for less. So, as far as money goes, it would come to the same thing. You will get it back again if Jose and the animals come back. But if we all do come back, $300 would be nothing one way or the other. Then comes the point. Would it be worthwhile to take him? There would be one more rifle in case we had to fight, and Jose has plenty of courage. I've seen him in a fix before now. He would look after the beasts and leave our hands free, and his pay would cost us nothing, for if we got there, he would help us gather and wash the gold. What is the drawback then, you asked. The drawback is that if we have to ride for it, he might hinder us. There ain't much in that, Doc, Sim Hallett put in. Our horses are pretty good, though they ain't much to look at. But the horses our mates here have got would leave them standing, and I don't know that Jose's best is much slower than ours. Besides, when you are working among those mountains, speed goes for nothing. A horse accustomed to them would pick his way among the rocks faster than a racehorse. If we are attacked, their running won't be much good to us. If we get fairly from the hills with the gold and the patches are on our trail, why, then we must trust a cunning and our mates here can ride clear away. We shan't do that, Sim, Hugh said. If we throw in our lot with you, we shall share it to the end, whatever it is. Well, that is all right, lad, but there are times when stopping to fight is just throwing away your life without doing no good. The doctor here and me ain't meant to desert mates, but when a time comes where it ain't no sort of good in the world to fight, and when those mates must get rubbed out whether you stick by them or not, then it is downright unreasonable for anyone as can get clear off to throw away his life foolish. Well, anyhow, Sim, Hugh said, it seems to me that it will be best to take Jose and his horses with us. It will, as you say, leave our hands free, and it will make the journey much more pleasant and will add one to our strength. Well, that would cost, you say, $300. How much will the rest of the outfit cost? 300 at the outside, the doctor said. We've been reckoning it up. Of course, we have all got kits, and it's only grub and ammunition we've got to buy, and two or three more shovels, and some pans for washing the sand, and another pick or two, and a couple of crowbars. Three hundred dollars will get as much grub as the four pack horses will carry, and make a good proper outfit for us. Will your money run to that? Hardly, Hugh said. That's just about what we have got between us. We had each six months pay to draw when we left the ranch, and I had some before. I think we are about twenty dollars short of the six hundred. That is plenty, the doctor said. If you put in four hundred, Sim and I can chip in another two hundred, as we shan't have to buy pack horses, so we have plenty between us. We shall see Jose tonight and talk it over with him, and if he agrees, he will come to you and bring a document for you to sign, saying that if he does not return in six months, the three hundred dollars are to be paid over for the use of his child. Then he will go with you to a priest and put the paper and the money in his hands, then you can hand him over your pack horse. He will take charge of it. Then, if you will give us $100, we will engage to get the outfit all provided. When it is all done, we will let you know what day you are to meet us and where. You see, we are asking you to trust us right through. That is all right, Hugh said. We are trusting you with our lives, and the dollars don't go for much in comparison. That is so, Sim Hallett said. Well, there is nothing more to say now. You would best ride back to the town and give yourself no more trouble about it. You will hear from us in a few days, or it may be a week. We shall buy half the things and send them on by Jose, then get the others and follow ourselves. It would set them talking here if we was to start with four loads. There are some pretty bad men about this place, you bet. Well, we shan't have much for them to plunder us of, Hugh said. Four laden horses wouldn't be a bad haul, but it ain't that I'm afraid of. If there were a suspicion as we was going out to work a rich thing, there is plenty of men here would get up a party to track us and fall on us either there or on our way back. 
There are two or three bands of brigands upon the mountains, and they are getting worse. There have been several haciendas burned and their people killed not so many miles from El Paso. Parties have been got up several times to hunt them down, but they never find them. And there is people here as believe that the officers of the Garda are in their pay. They have come across us more than once when we have been prospecting, but they don't interfere with men like us because, firstly, we haven't got anything worth taking. Anyway, nothing worth risking a half a dozen lives to get. And in the next place, if it had got known they had touched any of our lot, the miners would all join and hunt them down, and they know right enough that it would be a different thing altogether to having to deal with the Mexicans. Five minutes later, Hugh and Royce were on their way back to El Paso. End of chapter 16, read by Dory Smith. Chapter 17 of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17, Carried Off. The next morning, in accordance with the promise they had given Don Ramon, he rode out to the hacienda. Royce sang that they were two great swells for him, and he would rather stop quietly at El Paso. Besides, he said, most likely Jose will come this morning, and I will stop and fix up that business with him. Hugh did not try to dissuade him, for he had seen that Royce was ill at ease on the occasion of his first visit. On reaching the hacienda, he received a hearty welcome from Don Ramon and his family, and Don Carlos rode with him over a part of the estate, where a large number of peons were engaged in the cultivation of tobacco, maize, and other grain. If you have time, Signor Hugh, you must go with me to see our other estates. Our principal one lies twenty leagues to the south. We have five hundred square miles of land there, and big herds of cattle and droves of horses. But I suppose you have seen enough cattle. Yes, there is no novelty about that, he replied. How many have you? There and in other places we have somewhere around a hundred fifty thousand head. As to the horses, we don't know. They are quite wild, and we drive them in and catch them as they are wanted. We have about a score of our best here, but these are the only animals we keep here, except bullocks for the plow and the teams to take the crops down to market. I hear you have been rather troubled with brigands lately. Have you any fear of them? The scoundrels, the young man exclaimed passionately. It is a disgrace that they are not hunted down. Yes, they have been very daring lately, and my father and several of the other haciendas have written lately to the authorities of Santa Fe complaining of the inactivity of the police here. I have tried to persuade my father to move down to our house at El Paso until the bands have been destroyed, but he laughs at the idea of danger. We have twenty armed peons sleeping in the outhouses, and twelve male servants in the house, and indeed there is little chance of their attacking us. Still, one cannot but feel uncomfortable with the ladies here. There are a hundred troops or so stationed in the fort at the other side of the river, and they have joined two or three times in the search for the brigands, but of course they are too far off to be any protection to us here. Besides, they are not of much use among the mountains. The officer in command is fonder of good wine than he is of the saddle. It is a difficult thing to rout out these brigands. Half the peasantry are in alliance with them, and they get information of everything that is going on. And even if we knew of their hiding places, there would be little chance of our taking them by surprise. However, sooner or later, I suppose, we shall have them. There is a large reward offered for their capture. Someone is sure to prove traitor at last. It is always the way with these bands. Someone thinks himself ill-used in the division of the booty, or takes offense with the leaders, or something of that sort, or is tempted by the reward, and then we get them all. If it wasn't for treachery, the country would soon become uninhabitable. His host would not hear of Hugh returning that evening to El Paso, but sent a peon in to tell Royce that he would not return until the next day. Hugh spent a delightful evening. The young ladies played on the mandolin and sang with their brother. The soft light, the luxurious appointments, and the ripple of female talk were strange and delightful after so long a time among rough surroundings, and it was with great reluctance that he mounted his horse and rode back on the following morning. He found on arrival that his comrade had arranged the matter with Jose and had deposited the money with the priest. As he was standing chatting to him at the door of the hotel, a ragged Mexican boy ran up, placed a scrap of paper in Hugh's hand, and at once started away. It is from the doctor, Hugh said, opening it, and then read as follows. I have something particular to say to you. It must be private. When you have received this, stroll quietly through the town as if you were only looking at the shops. Go down to the river and follow it up till you hear three whistles. Then come to them. You had better come alone. The doctor. I wonder what the little man has got to say, Royce. 
To know, the other said. I suppose you had better go and see. You've got your six shooter anyhow? Hugh obeyed his instructions and walked along the river bank till he heard the whistles. They came from a small clump of bushes standing apart from any others. As he approached it, he heard the doctor's voice. Look round and see if there is anyone in sight. No one that I can see, he replied. Then come in. Hugh pushed his way through the bushes. Why, what is the matter, doctor? He asked, surprised at all these precautions. I will tell you. Sit down there. It is just as we fancied it might be. I told you that we might be watched. These confounded Mexicans have nothing to do but watch, and they have found out what we are after. How did you learn that, doctor? Well, the doctor said reluctantly, my mate has but one fault. He will sometimes go in for a drink. It's not often, but just occasionally, once perhaps every few months. It has always been so ever since I have known him. Well, last night it came over him. He thought it would be a long while before he would have a chance again, I suppose. He is not quarrelsome when he drinks, but you may be sure I always go with him so as to take care of him. So yesterday evening, seeing that he had made up his mind for it and was not to be turned, I went with him to a little wine shop near where we lodge. There were half a dozen Mexicans in there drinking and talking, and as they stopped talking directly, we went in. I saw we were not wanted, but I noticed more than that. I saw two of them glance at each other, and though I could not recollect I had ever set eyes on them before, I knew they saw us. We hadn't any money on us beyond what was wanted to pay for the liquor, so though I didn't like the look of them, I was not uneasy. We sat down and called for some liquor, and I managed to say to Sim, These chaps know us, Sim. Don't you go drinking? He nodded. We drank for a bit, at least he did. I don't touch spirits. Then, talking carelessly out loud, we, in whispered asides, made out a plan. We agreed that we should quarrel, and I should go out, and that he should seem to go on drinking until he got drunk and stupid, and then, like enough, he might hear something. So we carried that out. As soon as he had drunk his glass, he called for another, and then another. I got up a row with him and told him he was always making a beast of himself. He said he would drink if he chose and wouldn't be interfered with by anyone. Then I got nasty, and we had a big row, and I went out. Then Sam went on drinking. He can stand a lot more than would floor most Mexicans. They got in to talk with him, and he could see they were trying to pump him as to what we were going to do, but you bet he didn't let much out. Then he got gradually stupid, and at last rolled off the seat onto the ground. For a bit, the Mexicans went on talking together, and then one of them crept over and felt his pockets and took the few dollars he had in them out. That convinced them he was dead off to sleep, and they went on talking. What he gathered was this. The fellows were spies of one of these bands. They had noticed you particularly when you came in, because it seems their captain was in the town and recognized your horse and told them he didn't like your being here, and they were to watch you sharp. They were in the crowd when there was the row about the horse, and they saw us having our talk with you. They followed you out to the Dons and back again, and when you rode out in the morning to meet us, they sent a boy after you, and he kept you in sight and tracked you up to the hut and then crawled up close and overheard what we were saying. They sent off word at once to their chief, and we were to be followed by two men. When they have traced us to this place, one is to ride back to some place where a dozen of them will be waiting to attack us on our way back. That is bad, Hugh said. What is to be done? This has got to be put a stop to, the doctor said calmly, though I don't see how yet. At any rate, Sim and I think we'd better not hurry. A few days won't make any difference, and something may occur. He picked up from their talk that the villains had something else in hand just at present, some stroke from which they expect to make a lot of money, but they talked low and he couldn't catch much of what they said. Maybe it will go wrong and the country may be roused and hunt them down, and if so, you bet we'll be in it. We have got chances enough to take in this job as it is. We don't want to reckon on brigands. Not that there is any much fear of them now that we know their plans. We have only got to ambush the men they send after us. Still, we ain't going to take any chances. These fellows may follow direct. They are sure to choose someone who knows the mountains well, and they may judge by our direction the course we are taking and go by other paths. They would know pretty well we are not the sort of people to fool with. Still, it is better to wait a little while and see if there is a chance of putting a stop to it here. It is not that we are feared of the skunks. If we could not throw them off our trail, we could fight them anyway, but one don't want to have them on one's mind. We have got plenty of things to think about without them. Oh, yes, I think it much better to stay here for a bit, doctor. 
There is no hurry about a start on our expedition. I should certainly like to take a share in routing out these bandits, especially as, from what you say, it seems that the men at their head are the fellows who murdered Don Ramon Perales' son and sold me his horse. I wonder which hacienda it is that they are meaning to attack. Yes, it is a pity Sim didn't manage to find that out. We would have caught them then. Have you any idea how strong the band is? They are not often over twenty, the doctor replied. Twenty is enough for their work, and if there were more, the shares of the plunger would be too small. But as I said, they have got friends everywhere and could probably gather thirty or forty more if they knew the troops were going to attack them. A Mexican is always ready on principle to join in if there is a chance of getting a shot at an American soldier. I suppose you have not the least idea in what direction these fellows have their headquarters. Well, I have some sort of an idea. At any rate, I know of one place where there is a party who don't care about being interfered with by strangers. Two or three months ago, when Sim and I were about 40 miles over to the northwest, we were in a village just at the mouth of a bit of a valley, and the girl who waited on us at the little wine shop whispered in my ear when the landlord's back was turned, Don't go up the valley. Well, we were not thinking of going up the valley, which was only a sort of gulch leading nowhere, but after that we thought that we would have a look at it. We took a goodish look round so as to get above it and looked down, and we saw a house lying among some trees, and lower down near the mouth of the valley made out two men sitting among some rocks on the shoulder. The sun shone on their gun barrels, but that didn't go for much, for the Mexicans out in the country pretty well always go armed. We watched them for a couple of hours, and as they didn't stir, we concluded they were sentries. The girl wouldn't have given us that warning unless there had been something wrong, and I expect that house was the headquarters of one of these gangs. What made her do it, I wonder, doctor? That I can't say, Lightning. It is never easy to say why a woman does a thing. She may have thought it a pity that Sim and I should get our throats cut, though I own that wouldn't be a thing likely to trouble a Mexican girl. Then she may have had a grudge against them. Perhaps they had shot some lover of hers, or one of them may have jilted her. Anyhow, there it was. And if we hear of any attack of brigands upon a hacienda, we will try that place before going any further. And now, lad, you had better be going back. I shall lie here quiet for an hour or two in case there should be anyone watching you, as is likely enough. He returned to the hotel and told Royce what he had heard. That will suit me, Bill said. I'm death on border ruffians, and if ever I see two of them, it were them fellas as sold you the horse at McKinney. And so it's their intention to follow us and wipe us out and get our swag? Well, maybe it will be the other way. If I was you, Lightning, I would ride over to Don Ramon's this evening and give him a hint to be on his guard. There's no reason why it should be his place they have gotten their mind more than any other. But the fact that they stole the son's horse, to say nothing of killing him, might turn their thoughts that way. If you do a fellow one injury, I reckon that like as not you will do him another. I don't know why it is so, but I reckon it's human nature. I will ride over at once, Hugh said. I wouldn't do that, Hugh. You don't know who may have been watching you, and if it is known that you had been meeting the doctor quiet, and the doctor is a mate of Sims, and Sim was in that wine shop, they will be putting things together, and if you ride straight over to Don Ramon now, they will think it is because of something the doctor has been saying to you. Then if it should chance, as that is the place they are thinking of, it are long odds that Sim and the doctor get a knife between their shoulders before bedtime. You go quietly off in the cool of the evening, just jogging along as if you was going to pay a visit of no particular account. They ain't got no interest in us except as to this expedition to find gold, and they won't concern themselves in your movements as long as I'm here at the hotel and the others ain't getting ready to make a start. They've learned all they want to learn about our going. Just as the sun was setting, Hugh set out. It was dark when he reached Don Ramon's hacienda. After chatting a while with Don Ramon, his wife and son, the two girls, their father said, being somewhere out in the garden, Hugh said quietly to the Mexican that he wanted to speak to him for a moment in private. Don Ramon lighted a fresh cigarette and then said carelessly, It is a lovely evening. We may as well stroll outside and find the girls. I don't suppose they know that you are here? Don Carlos followed them into the broad veranda outside the house. Your son can hear what I have to say, Hugh said in reply to an inquiring look from Don Ramon and then reported the conversation that Sim had overheard. Father and son were both much excited at the statement that the horse had been recognized. Then poor Estefan's murderers are somewhere in this neighborhood, the Don exclaimed. That is the part of the story that interests me most, senor. As to attacking my hacienda, I don't believe they would venture upon it. They must know that they would meet with a stout resistance, and El Paso is but three miles away. Daring as they are, they would scarcely venture on such an undertaking. 
but I will, of course, take every precaution. I will order four men to be on guard at night, bid the others sleep with their arms ready at hand, and see that the shutters and doors are barred at night. But the other matter touches us nearly. If Estefan's murderers are in the province, we will hunt them down if I have to arm all the vaqueros and peons and have a regular campaign against them. You were quite right not to mention this before my wife. She and my daughters had better know nothing about it. By the way, I wonder where the girls are. They are not generally as late as this. I suppose the evening has tempted them. It is full moon tomorrow. He raised his voice and called the girls. There was no reply. Carlos, do you go and look for them and tell them for me to come up to the house. And now, senor, we will have a cup of coffee. In a quarter of an hour, Carlos returned. I cannot find them, father. I have been all around the garden calling them. Don Ramon rose from his seat and struck a bell on the table. They must have gone up to their rooms, he said, without coming in here. When the servant appeared, he said, Rosita, go up to the senorita's rooms and tell them that Don Hugh Turnstall is here. They are not there, senor. I have just come down from their rooms. What can have become of them, Carlos? Don Ramon said. I have no idea, father. They had Lion with them. He was asleep here when they called him from outside, and I saw him get up and dash through the open window. I can't understand it, the Don said anxiously, for the evening is cold. Besides, they would scarcely go outside the garden after nightfall. They might be down at Chiquita's cottage, father. Oh, yes, I didn't think of that, Carlos, Don Ramon said. Yes, they are often down at their old nurses. Rosita, tell Juan to go down to Chiquita's cottage and beg the young ladies to return, as I want them. In ten minutes, the servant came back. They are not there, senor. They left there just as it was getting dark. Surely there is nothing to be uneasy about, Ramon, his wife said. The girls are often out as late as this on a moonlight evening. They are sure to be about the garden somewhere. But Carlos has been around, Don Ramon said. Well, we will go and have another look for them. Followed by the two young men, he stepped out onto the veranda. Carlos, he said, go round to the men's quarters and tell them your sisters are missing and that they are all to turn out and search. I don't like this, he said to Hugh after his son had left. I should have thought nothing of it at any other time, but after what you have just been telling me, I feel nervous. Now let us go round the garden. They traversed all the walks, Don Ramon repeatedly calling the girls' names. They were joined in their search by Don Carlos and a number of the men. They are certainly not in the garden, Don Ramon said at last. Now, let us go down towards Chiquita's cottage. They may either have followed the road on their way back or have come along a bypath to the garden. We will go by the path and return the other way. The path lay through a shrubbery. Just as they entered it, a man met them running. Well, what is it, Juan? Don Ramon asked as he came up, and he could see his face by the light of the torches some of the men were carrying. I don't know, senor, but we have just come upon some fresh blood on the path. With a cry of alarm, Don Ramon ran forward with his son and Hugh. Fifty yards farther, they saw two of the men standing with torches in the middle of the path. Here is blood, senor, one of them said. We passed it without noticing it on our way to the cottage. We were not examining the ground. But on our way back, the light of the torches fell upon it. Don Ramon stood staring in speechless horror at the large patch of blood on the path. There has been a struggle here, Hugh said, examining the ground. See, there are marks of large feet. Some of them have trod in the blood. See, Don Carlos and he pointed to a line of blood drops leading to one of the bushes. Search, Hugh, the young man groaned. I dare not. Hugh motioned one of the men with a torch to follow him. The father and son stood gazing after them as they entered the bushes. A moment later, Hugh called out, It is the dog, senors. There is nothing else. An exclamation of joy broke from the two Mexicans. They were at least relieved of the overpowering dread that had seized them at the sight of the blood, and at once joined Hugh. The dog, a fine Cuban bloodhound, was lying dead, stabbed in a dozen places. What can it mean, father? Don Carlos said in a low voice. I can hardly think, the Mexican said, passing his hand across his forehead. I am afraid, senor, it is too evident, Hugh put in. This is the explanation of what my friend heard. The brigands did not intend to attack the hacienda. They have carried off your daughters, and the hound has died in their defense. That must be it, Don Ramon exclaimed in the deepest anguish. Oh, my poor girls, how can it have happened? I expect they were in hiding here, Hugh said, and sprang up suddenly and seized and gagged the senoritas before they had time to scream. The hound doubtless sprang upon them, and as you see, they killed it with their knives. What is to be done? Don Ramon asked hopelessly. The first thing is to follow the path down to the road, Hugh said. Probably they had horses somewhere. 
Will you tell the men to go along cautiously with their torches near the ground? Don Carlos gave the order in Mexican. One of the party, who was the chief hunter at the hacienda, went a little ahead of the others with a torch. He stopped a short distance before he reached the junction of the path with the road, which they could see ahead of them in the moonlight. Here are fresh marks of horses' hooves, he said. See, and he held the torch above his head and pointed to the bushes. Twigs have been broken and there are fresh leaves upon the ground. The horses must have been hidden here. Do not move until I examine down to the road. He went forward alone and returned in two or three minutes. There are faint tracks from the road to this point. They came along at a walk. There are deep ones down to the road and along it. They went off at a gallop. There were six of them. What is to be done, Signor? Don Ramon said to Hugh. My brain seems on fire and I cannot think. I should imagine your daughters can be in no immediate danger, Signor, Hugh said quietly. The brigands have doubtless carried them off in order to wring a heavy ransom from you. They must have got two hours start, and I fear pursuit would be useless tonight, though I would send three of the men accustomed to tracking on at once to follow their traces and to learn the direction they have taken after leaving here. Of course it will be for you to decide whether you will go down to the town and see the alcalde and obtain a posse of men to join your vaqueros in a search for them, and then to cross the river to the fort and get help of the troops and scour the whole country, or whether you will wait until you hear, as you doubtless will, from the brigands. Let us go back to the house, Don Ramon replied. We must think it over. We must not do anything rash or we might endanger their lives. The news had reached the house before they arrived there. Donna Maria was completely prostrated with grief. The women were crying and wringing their hands, and the wildest confusion prevailed. Don Ramon had by this time recovered himself and sternly ordered silence. He then proceeded to the room where his wife had been carried and endeavored to assure her that there was little fear for their daughters' lives, for the brigands could have no purpose in injuring them and had only carried them off for the purpose of exacting a ransom. "'What do you think really had best be done, my friend?' Don Carlos asked Hugh when they were alone together. "'Of course, whatever ransom these villains ask must be paid, although I have no doubt it will be something enormous.' But it is terrible to think of the girls being even for an hour in their hands, especially when we feel sure that these men are the murderers of my brother. I should say, he replied, that whatever they demand must be paid. It will not do to risk the senorita's lives by doing anything as long as they are in their hands. But I should advise that the moment they are free, we should fall upon these scoundrels and exterminate them and recover the ransom. I think that I have a clue to the place where they are likely to be taken. One of my minor friends was speaking to me of a place that would be likely to be used for such a purpose. He could lead a party there, but it would never do to attempt it while the ladies are in their hands. You may be sure that a careful watch will be kept, and at the first alarm the villains might murder them. We will hear what your father says when he returns, and if he thinks, as I do, that we can attempt nothing until he receives some communication from the brigands, I will ride back to El Paso and consult my friends there. Don Ramon, on his return, said that he was strongly of opinion that it would risk the girls' lives were any movement made until he heard of them. As he could be of no utility, Hugh rode over to El Paso, Don Carlos saying that he would let him know the instant they received any communication from the brigands, but that he should anyhow see him in the morning, as he should ride over with his father to report the matter to the authorities. It was past ten o'clock when Hugh reached the hotel. It happened to be a festa, and the square was full of people and the cafes and wine shops open. Royce was in the barroom of the hotel. Royce, do you know where Sim and the doctor are likely to be found? I saw them sitting in front of the wine shop in the corner of the square not more than ten minutes ago. Come along with me then, Bill. But I thought we weren't to be seen with them, Royce said. There could be no reason against it now, he replied. They have learned all they wanted to learn about it and know that we are going together. At any rate, our meeting would seem to be accidental. Is anything up, Hugh? Royce asked as they made their way through the crowd in the square. You look troubled. I will tell you directly, Bill. There they are. They are still at the same table, Hugh. There were two empty chairs at the table. Hugh nodded carelessly to the doctor and Sim and sat down beside them. After what you told me this morning, doctor, there can be no harm in our being seen together. I want to talk to you badly. There are too many people about here. Do you mind both coming down to the river? We can talk as we go. Directly they were out of the square. He told the three men what had happened. "'Carried off those two young ladies!' Royce exclaimed. "'By thunder, that is too bad. What is to be done, boys?' "'Let us wait until we know all about it,' Sim replied, while the doctor said in his quiet way, "'This has really got to be put a stop to. Let us wait until we are down by the river. We must hear all this quietly, Lightning. Four men can't talk as they walk.' 
They soon gained a quiet spot away from the houses. Now, tell us how it came about, the doctor said. And while we are talking, each of you keep his eyes and ears open. We have behaved like fools once and let ourselves be overheard. We won't do it again. Hugh told the whole story of the girl's abduction and stated the determination arrived at by Don Ramon not to attempt a pursuit, but to pay whatever ransom was demanded and then to hunt the brigands down. That is all very well, the doctor said, but when they have once got the money and you may be sure it will be a very big sum, they will divide it and scatter and there won't be one of them in the district 12 hours after the girls are given up. But what is he to do, doctor? Sim Hallett said. He daren't move until he gets the gals. They would cut their throats sure if he did. My idea was, Sim, Hugh said, that if this is the work of the band in that house the doctor was telling me about this morning, we could be in hiding near it, and directly the men who take the girls back to their father return with the ransom, we could fall upon them, destroy the whole band, and get back the money. We should want a big force to surround the place, Sim replied, and there would be no getting it there without being seen. You bet there are a score of them on the lookout, and their friends would bring them word long before we got there of such a force being on the way. Besides, there is no surety that it is the place where the gals are, and even if it is, the whole band may leave when they send the gals away. They may scatter all over the country and meet again at night fifty miles off. Another thing is, you may bet your boots there will be a lot of trouble about handing over that ransom, and they won't give them up until after they have got the money. I see that there are all sorts of difficulties before us, Sim, but I am sure you and the doctor will see some way out of it. I am deeply interested in rescuing these poor girls, and we are all interested in this band being wiped out before we start. Have you any plan at all? The doctor asked. You've had longer time to think this over than we have. Well, doctor, my idea was that we could start tonight and get to some place among the hills where we could hide our horses a mile or two from this house where we suppose they are. We should lie quiet there tomorrow. The next evening we should make our way down and try to ascertain for certain whether they are there and see whether it is possible to carry them off. Of course, that couldn't be attempted unless we are absolutely certain of being able to protect them. If we could get them out without being seen, we might try to do it. If it is not certain we could do that and get off without being seen, I should say one of us should ride back next morning to Don Ramon and get him to bring up twenty or thirty of his men, or if not, a body of troops from the fort. We should guide them at night to a point as near the house as it would be safe for them to get. Then we four could crawl down to the house. The moment we are in a position to protect the girls, that is to say, if we can get into the room where they are kept, we will fire a pistol shot out of the window as a signal. Then we shall have to make as good a fight of it as we can till the others come up to help us. You may be sure that the brigands will be all pretty well occupied with us, and the other party will be able to surround the house and then rush in to our assistance. That looks like a good plan, by thunder, Sim Hallett said. What do you say, doctor? Well, I think it might be worked somehow on those lines, the doctor agreed. I don't think there is much danger for the ladies, because if the brigands did come upon us when we were scouting, some of them would attack us and the rest would carry the ladies off to some other hiding place. I don't say if they were surrounded and saw no chance of escape, they mightn't kill them out of revenge, but they would never do that until the last thing, because they would reckon, and truly enough, that as long as they are in their hands, they have got the means of making terms for themselves. But to one thing I agree anyhow. Let us get our horses and start at once. Don't let us go together. We will meet at the first crossroad a mile to the west of the town. No one is likely to notice us going out. There are plenty of people who have come in from the country to this festa. Besides, just at present, they won't be watching us. They know what our plans are and that we don't intend to start for another week, and they won't be giving a thought to us until this affair of the girls is settled. What do you say, Sim? That is right enough, Sim said, but we must be careful about the roads, doctor. Like enough, they will have a man on every road going anywhere near the place and perhaps miles away. Yes, we must make a big circuit, the doctor agreed. Strike the hills 15 or 20 miles away from their place and then work up through them so as to come down right from the other side. Shall I get some provisions at the hotel? Hugh asked. No, we will attend to that. There are plenty of places open and we will get what is wanted. Now, do you and Bill go back by yourselves? We will follow in a minute or two. End of chapter 17. Read by Dory Smith. Chapter 18 of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. The Brigands Haunt. By daybreak on the following morning, Hugh and his three companions were far among the hills. They had halted an hour before and intended to wait until noon before pursuing their journey. 
They had already been eight hours in the saddle and had traveled over 60 miles. They halted in a little valley where there was plenty of grass for the horses, and after cooking some food, lay down and slept until the sun was nearly overhead. Fortunately, the two miners had traversed the country several times and were able to lead them across the mountains where otherwise it would have been impossible to find a way. After four hours riding, on emerging from a valley, the doctor said, There, do you see that village three miles away? That is the village where we stopped. The gorge in which the house lies runs from the village in this direction. You cannot see it here. It is sort of a canyon cut out ages ago by the water. The sides are nearly perpendicular, but at the upper end the bottom rises rapidly, and as far as we could see from the spot from which we looked at it, there is no difficulty in getting down there. As you see, there are woods lying back to the left. We have got to come down at the back of them, and there is no chance of our being seen, even if they have got men on the lookout on the high ground above the house. They will be looking the other way. They can see miles across the plain there. Of course, they have no reason to believe that anyone knows of their haunt. Still, they are always on the lookout against treachery. Well, let's go on at a trot now, Doctor. We shall be in the wood before sunset. When they reached the trees, they dismounted and led their horses until they perceived daylight through the trunks on the opposite side. Now we will finish the remainder of our dinner, the doctor said, and talk matters over. We are about half a mile now from the end of the valley, and it is another half mile down to the house. Now, what are we going to do? Are we all going or only one? He was silent. These men understood matters better than he did. Only one, of course, Sim Hallett said. The others can come on to the top of the valley so as to lend a hand if he is chased, but it would be just chucking our lives away for more than one to go. Well, it is either you or me, Doc. Why? you asked. I am quite ready to go, and I am sure Bill is, too. Besides, this question of the young ladies is more my affair than yours, since you do not know them, and I certainly think I ought to be the one to go. There is one reason again at Lightning, Sim said. What you say is true, and if it came to running, you could leg it a good bit faster than the dock or me. But that don't count for much in the dark. It is creeping and crawling that is wanted more than running. The reason why the dock or I must go is you don't speak Mexican, and we do. It ain't likely that the young ladies will be seen out in the veranda, and one can't go and look into each of the windows till we find the right one. We've got to listen, and that way we may find whether they are there, and if we are lucky, which room they are in. So, you see, it is for one of us to go. I shall go, Sim, the doctor said quietly. I can walk as lightly as a cat. I have an above half as much bulk to hide as you have, and I am cunning while you are strong, and this is a case where cunning is of more use than strength. So, it is settled that I go, but you may as well give me your six-shooter. I may want twelve barrels. I shall be sorry for the Mexicans if you use them all, Doc, Sim Hallett said, handing over his pistol to the doctor. I would rather go myself, but I know when you have once made up your mind to anything, it ain't no sort of use arguing. That's right, the doctor said, putting the weapon into his belt. Well, there is just time for a pipe before I start. The sun has been down nearly half an hour, and the moon won't be up over those hills there for another hour, so we shall have it dark till I get well down into the valley, and the moon won't be high enough to throw its light down before I am back again. A wonderful man is the doctor, Sim Hallett said when, with noiseless step, he had made his way down into the upper end of the ravine. You wouldn't think much of him to look at him, but you bet he has got as much grit as if he was ten times as big. See him going about, and you would say he might be one of them missionaries, or a scientific chap, such as those as comes round looking after birds and snakes and such like. He sort of seems most like a woman, with his low talk and gentle way. And yet, I suppose he has killed more downright bad men than any five men on this side of Missouri. You don't say so, Hugh said in surprise. Yes, sir. He is a whole team and a little dog under the wagon, he is. He ain't a chap to quarrel. He don't drink, and he don't gamble, and he speaks everyone fair and civil. It ain't that, but he has got something in him that seems to swell up when he hears of bad goings on. When there is a real bad man comes to the camp where he is and takes to bossing the show and to shooting free, after a time you can see the doctor gets uncomfortable in his mind, but he goes on till that bad man does something out of the way, shoots a fella just out of pure cussedness or something of that kind, then he just says this must be put down, and off he goes and faces that bad man and gives him a fair show and lays him out. You mean he doesn't fire until the other man has healed, Sim? Yes, I mean that. Then how is it he hasn't got himself killed? That is what we have said a hundred times, Lightning. 
He has been shot all over, but never mortally. One thing, his looks are enough to scare a man. Somehow, he don't look altogether earthly with that white hair of his, and it has been the same color ever since I've known him, floating back from his face. He goes in general bareheaded when he sets out to shoot, and the hair somehow seems to stand out, not a bit like it does other times. I heard a chap who had been a doctor afore he took to gold digging say his hair looked as if it had been electrified. Then he gets as white as snow, and his eyes just blaze out. I tell you, sir it is something frightful to see him. And when he comes right into a crowded saloon and says to the men, as he always does say in a sort of tone that seems to somehow frizz up the blood of every man that hears it, it is time for you to die. You bet it makes the very hardest man weaken. I tell you, I would rather face Judge Lynch and a hundred regulators than stand up again the doctor when his fit is on. And I have seen men who never miss their mark afore shoot wide of him altogether. And he never misses, Royce asked. Miss, Sim repeated. The doctor couldn't miss if he tried. I've never known his bullet to go a hair's breadth off the mark. It always hits plumb in the center of the forehead. If there is more than one of them, the doc turns on the others and warns him, Get out of the camp before night, and you bet they get. He gives me a lot of trouble, the doc does, in the way of nursing. I've put it to him over and over again, if it is fair on me, that he should be on his back three months every year, because that is about what it's been since I've known him. He allows as it ain't fair, but, as he says, it ain't me, Sim, I've got to do it. I'm like a melee running amuck. Them's chaps out somewhere near China, he tells me, as gets mad and goes for a whole crowd, and I can't help it, and I don't think he can. And yet, you know, at other times, he is just about the kindest chap that breathes. He is always a nussing the sick and sitting up nights with them and such like. That is why he got the name of doctor. He isn't really a doctor then, Hugh asked. Well, Lightning, all that's his secret, and if he thinks to tell you, he can do it. I know he is the best mate a man ever had, and one of the best critters in God's universe, and that is good enough for me. I reckon he must be somewhere down among them Mexicans by this time, he went on, changing the subject abruptly. I almost wish one of us had gone with him, Royce said, so that if he should get found out, we might make a better fight of it. He ain't likely to get found out, Sim said quietly, and if he does, he can fight his way out. I don't know what way the doctor will die, but I allowed years ago that it weren't going to be by a bullet. I ain't scary about him. If I had thought there were any kind of risk, I would have gone with him, you bet. It was two hours before the doctor suddenly stood in the moonlight before them. They had been listening attentively for some time, but had not heard the slightest sound until he emerged from the shadow of the ravine. Well, doctor, are we on the right scent? The girls are there, Sam, sure enough. Now let us go back to the wood before we talk. We have been caught asleep once on this expedition when we thought we were so safe that we needn't be on the watch, and I don't propose to throw away a chance again. They went back without another word to the wood. As soon as they reached it, the doctor sat down at the foot of the tree and lighted his pipe. The others followed his example. Well, there was no danger about that job, he began. It seems not to have struck the fools that anyone was likely to come down from this end of the gulch. Down at the other end, they have got two sentries on each side upon the heights, I could see them in the moonlight. I reckon they have some more at the mouth of the valley, down near the village, but you may guess I asked no questions about it. I saw no one in the gulch until I got down close to the house. It is as strong a place as if it had been built for the purpose. It stands on a sort of table of rock that juts out from the hillside, so that on three sides it goes straight down. There is a space around the house forty or fifty feet wide. On the side where the rock stands out from the hill, they have got a wall twelve feet high with a strong gate in it. On that side of the house, they have bricked all the windows up so as to prevent their being commanded by a force on the hillside above them, and all the windows on the ground floor all round are bricked up too. I expect the rooms are lighted from a courtyard inside. So you see, it is a pretty difficult sort of place to take all of a sudden. I could hear the voices of five or six men sitting, smoking, and talking outside the door, which is not on the side facing the hill, but on the other side. I guessed that when the house was built, there must have been steps up from that side, for there is a road that runs along the bottom of the valley. So I crawled up and found that it was so. There had been a broad flight of steps there. They had been broken away and pulled down. Still, they were good enough for me. There were one or two blocks still sticking out from the rock, and there were holes where other blocks had been let in, and I made a shift to climb up without much difficulty till I got my eyes level with the top. The moon hadn't risen over the brow. Still, it was lighter than I liked, 
but one had to risk something, so I first of all pulled myself up, crawled along the edge till I got round the corner, and then went up to the house and examined the windows on the other side, and then got back to the top of the steps and began to listen. I soon heard the girls were there. They had brought them straight there after they had carried them off. A man had started early the next morning with a letter to Don Ramon demanding ransom. He was expected back sometime tonight. They had had news so far that the Don was taking no steps to raise the country, though the news of the girls being carried off was generally known. I didn't hear what the sum named for the ransom was, but the men were talking over what they should each do with their share of it, and they reckoned that each would have seven or eight thousand dollars. Well, there wasn't anything new about this. The matter of interest to us was which was the room where the girls were, as the journey would have been of no sort of use if I could not find that out. There was nothing to do but get up again and crawl along to the house. I had reckoned that I should most likely want my rope and had wound it around my waist. There was a guard at the gate, so it was one of the sides I had to try. I had learned from what the men said that most of the gang were away scattered all over the country down to El Paso so as to bring news at once if there was any search for the girls going on. The chief and his lieutenant were down in the village and would ride in with the messenger who brought down Ramon's answer. There was a guard inside the house because the men at the fire said it was time for two of them to go and relieve them, but I guessed that otherwise the house was empty. I threw my rope over a balcony and climbed up, opened the fastening of the window with my knife and went in. Everything was quiet. I felt my way across the room to a window on the other side. I opened that and looked down into the courtyard. Two or three lanterns were burning there, and I saw two men sitting on a bench that was placed across a door. They were smoking cigarettes and had their guns leaning against the wall beside them. There was no doubt that was the room where the girls were. It was on the opposite side of the courtyard to that where I was standing, that is, on the side of the house facing down the valley, and was the corner room. I had learned everything I wanted now, so I had nothing to do but to shut the window, slide down the rope, shake it off the balcony, and come back again. And here I am. Well done, doctor. You have succeeded splendidly. But what a pity we didn't all go with you. We could have cleared out that lot and rescued the girls at once. You might not have gone as quietly as I did, the doctor said. Four men make a lot more noise than one, and at the slightest noise, the seven men at the door would have been inside, the door bolted, and the first pistol shot would have brought in the guard at the gate, the four sentries on the height, and I expect as many more from the mouth of the valley. It would have been mighty difficult to break into the house with nine men inside and as many out. Besides, it would never do to run risks, and even if we had done it and hadn't found the girls with their throats cut, we should have had to fight our way up the valley to the horses, and a bullet might have hit one of them. No, no. This is a case where we have no right to risk anything. It's for the Don to decide what is to be done. Now we all know about it and can lay it before him. Lightning, you had better saddle up and ride with me. You must go because he knows you and will believe what you tell him. I must go because he will want me to guide the force back here so as to avoid any chance of their being seen on the way. The horses have done 80 miles since this time yesterday, so it's no use thinking of starting tonight. Besides, there's no hurry. We'll be off in the morning. After breakfast, Sim was about to saddle the doctor's horse when Royce said, The doctor had better take my horse. He is miles faster than his own. The girths were tightened. The doctor, as he mounted, said to Sim, You will keep a sharp lookout over the house and reckon up how many go in and come out. I expect that the Don writes to say he will pay the money. A good many of those outside will come here. We will keep our eyes open, doctor. It may be two or three days before you hear of us, Sim. There's no hurry, doctor. There will be lots of talk about how the ransom is to be paid before anything is done. Do you mean to go back the same way we came? Hugh asked the doctor as they rode off. No, there's no occasion for that. We will ride 30 miles or so along the foot of the hills east and then strike straight by the road for El Paso. It is about nine o'clock now. We shall be there by five o'clock. We won't go in together. I will wait on the road and come in by some other way after dark, or what would be better, put up at Jose's. You had better not go up to the Don's until tomorrow morning. Were you to go up directly you return, the scoundrels who are watching both you and the Don might suspect that your journey has had a connection with his business. Next morning, Hugh arrived at Don Ramon's, having obtained another horse at the hotel. Why, where have you been, Senor Hugh? Don Carlos exclaimed as the servant showed him into the room where they were at breakfast. When I rode with my father into the town to give the Acolade notice, I went to the hotel and found that you were out. We sent over there three times yesterday and the day before, but they knew nothing of you. 
You had taken your horse and gone out the evening you returned, and had left no word when you would come back. We have been quite anxious about you, and feared that some harm had befallen you also. We were quite sure that you would not have left without telling us of your intentions. No, indeed, Hugh said. I should have been ungrateful indeed for your kindness if I had left you in such terrible trouble. But before I tell you what I have been doing, please let me know what has happened here. About midday, the day after my daughters had been stolen, Don Ramon said, a horseman rode up. I saw him coming and guessed he was the man we were expecting. He was shown in here and Carlos and myself received him. He handed me a letter. Here it is. I will translate it. Senor Don Ramon Perales, if you wish to see your daughters alive, you will, as speedily as possible, collect $200,000 in gold and hand them over to the messenger I will send for them. When I receive the money, your daughters shall be returned to you. I give you warning that if any effort is made to discover their whereabouts, or if any armed body is collected by you for the purpose of rescue, your daughters will at once be put to death. Signed, Ignatius Guitiero. And what did you reply, Don Ramon? I wrote that it would take some time to collect so great a sum in gold, but that I would send up to Santa Fe at once and use every effort to get it together in the shortest possible time. I demanded, however, what assurance I could have that after the money was paid, my daughters would be returned to me. To that, I have received no answer. No, you could hardly get one before this morning, he said. You look surprised, senor, but we have found out where they are hidden. You have found that out, the others cried in astonishment. My companions and I, Hugh said. Indeed, beyond riding a good many miles, I have had but little to do with the matter. The credit lies entirely with the two miners I spoke to you of, with whom I was going shortly to start on an expedition to a placer they know of. He then related the reason why the miners had suspected where the gang of brigands had their headquarters, and the steps by which they had ascertained that the girls were really there, and then explained the scheme that he and the doctor had, on their ride down, arranged for their rescue. Don Ramon, his wife and son, were greatly moved at the narrative. "'You have indeed rendered us a service that we can never repay,' Don Ramon said. "'But the risk is terrible. Should you fail, it would cost you your lives and would ensure the fate of my daughters.' We are in no way afraid about our own lives, Don Ramon. There are not likely to be more than twenty of these scoundrels there, and if we were discovered before we could get to your daughters, we could fight our way off, I think. In that case, seeing that there were only four of us, they certainly would not throw away their prospect of a ransom by injuring their captives. They would suppose that we had undertaken it on our own account as a sort of speculation, and though no doubt they would remove your daughters at once to some other place, they would not injure them. You see, our plan is that the force we propose shall be at hand, shall not advance unless they hear three shots fired at regular intervals. That will be the signal that we have succeeded in entering your daughter's apartment and that they are safe with us. In that case, you will push forward at once to assist us. If, on the other hand, you hear an outbreak of firing, you will know that we have been discovered before we reached your daughter's and will retreat with your force silently and return to El Paso by the same route by which you went out. And you would then, of course, continue your negotiations for a ransom. At any rate, Don Carlos said, I claim the right of accompanying you. It is my sisters who are in peril, and I will not permit strangers to risk their lives for them when I remain safe at a distance. You must agree to that, senor. I agree to that at once, Hugh said. I thought that it was probable that you would insist upon going with us. It is clearly your right to do so. It must not be attempted, Don Ramon said gravely, if in any way I can recover my daughters by paying the ransom. The risk would be terrible, and although $200,000 is a large sum, I would pay it four times over rather than that risk should be run. The question is, what guarantee the brigands will give that they will return their captives after they have received the money? I shall know that soon. We will decide nothing until I receive the answer. Would it not be well, senor, for you to go over to arrange with the officer in command of the fort for twenty or thirty men to start with you at a moment's notice? If you decide to make this attempt to rescue your daughters, the sooner we set about it, the better. That is, if you intend to take troops instead of a party of your own men. I have already seen the commandant, Don Ramon said. He is a personal friend and rode over here directly he heard the news and offered to place the whole of his force at my disposal, should I think fit to use it. At this moment, a servant entered and said that a man wished to see Don Ramon. The Mexican left the room and returned in a minute with a letter. It was brief. Senor, if you want your daughters back again, you must trust us. We give no guarantees beyond our solemn pledge. You will tell my messenger on what day you will have the money ready and do not delay more than a week. 
he will come again to fetch it. See that he is not followed, for it will cost your daughters their lives if an attempt is made to find out where he goes. Your daughters will be returned within twenty-four hours of your sending out the money. We will try your plan, Signor, Don Ramon said firmly. I would not trust the word of these cutthroats, or their oaths even, in the smallest matter, and assuredly not in one such as this. What shall I say in reply to this letter? I should write and say that, although their conditions are hard, you must accept them, but that you doubt whether you can raise so large a sum of gold in the course of a week, and you beg them to give ten days before the messenger returns for it, and you pledge your honor that no attempt whatever shall be made to follow or to ascertain the course he takes. Don Ramon wrote the letter and took it down to the hall where the messenger was waiting, surrounded by servants who were regarding him with no friendly aspect. There is my answer, Don Ramon said as he handed the letter to the man. Tell your leader I shall keep my word and that I trust him to keep his. Now, Signor Hugh, will you give me the details of your plan? How do you propose that the troops are to be close at hand when required without their presence being suspected? The doctor's idea was this, Signor that you should this morning send a letter by a servant to the commandant. Will you tell him that you believe you have a clue to your daughter's hiding place, but that everything depends upon the troops getting near the spot without suspicion being excited? Will you beg him to maintain an absolute silence as to any movements of the troops until tonight, and to issue no orders until the gates are shut and all communication closed? Will he then order an officer and twenty men to be ready at four o'clock in the morning to start under the guidance of a miner who will tonight arrive at the fort bearing your card? This will, of course, be the doctor. Request the officer to place himself absolutely in his hands. Our plan is that they shall keep the other side of the river, travel some thirty miles up, and then halt until nightfall. At that point, they would be as far from the brigands' hiding place as they are here, and if the fact that a detachment has started becomes known to the friends of the brigands, it will not be suspected that there is any connection between their journey and the affair with your daughters. After nightfall, they will start again, cross the river, and meet you and myself at one o'clock near the village of Ejanko. Thence we shall go up into the hills, rest there all day, and come down upon the gulch where the brigands' haunt lies. That sounds an excellent plan, Signor. But how do you propose that we shall get away without being noticed tomorrow evening? The doctor and I agreed that the best plan you could adopt would be to ride over and see your banker the first thing in the morning. That will seem perfectly natural. Then in the evening, after dark, you and Don Carlos should again ride down to him. You will naturally take at least four of your men down with you as a guard. You will leave your horses with them when you enter the banker's. You will then pass through his house and at once leave by the back entrance, wrapped in your cloaks. You will then proceed to a spot half a mile out of the town where Juan, who you say knows the country, will be waiting with your horses, and I also will be there. The people who are watching you, and you will certainly be watched, will naturally suppose that you are at the banker's. At ten o'clock he will come to the door and tell your men to return home with your horses and to bring them back at ten in the morning, as you and your son will sleep there. Even should anything be suspected, which is hardly likely, the scoundrels would have no clue whatever as to the direction you will have taken, as, at any rate, you will have had two hours start before they can begin to think that anything is wrong. That is a capital plan, Signor. You keep on adding to our already deep obligations to you. Everything was carried out in accordance with the arrangements. Hugh returned at once to El Paso, and in the evening the doctor mounted his horse and rode to the fort. The next day passed quietly, and as soon as it became dark, Hugh went out to the stable, saddled his horse without seeing any of the men about the yard, and rode off in the direction of Don Ramon's, and then, making a circuit of the town, arrived at the spot where Juan was waiting with the horses. They had been placed in a thicket a short distance from the road so as to be unobserved by anyone who might happen to pass. Hugh took his post close to the road, and an hour later Don Ramon and his son came up. The horses were at once brought out, and they mounted and rode off, Juan riding ahead to show the way. They maintained a fast pace, for at one o'clock they were to meet the troops at the appointed place. They arrived a quarter of an hour before the time, and ten minutes after the hour heard the tramping of horses. The doctor was riding ahead and halted when he came up to the group. "'Has it all gone well, Lightning?' he asked. "'Excellently, as far as we know.' "'This is Lieutenant Mason, who is in command of the troops,' the doctor said as a figure rode forward. Lieutenant Mason, this is Don Ramon Perales. You are punctual, Signor, the officer said. I have orders to place myself and my men entirely at your disposal. I think we had better have half an hour's halt before we go further. 
We have ridden fast, and you must have ridden faster, as your guide told me you were not to leave El Paso until eight o'clock, and I presume we have a good deal farther to go tonight. Another twenty miles, the doctor said. The moon will be getting higher, and we shall want all her light. It will do no harm if we halt an hour, Lieutenant, and eat our supper while the horses are eating theirs. During the halt, the doctor had a long talk with Juan, who came from this part of the country and knew it well. When they mounted, instead of riding through the town, they struck off by a bypath before they reached it. Three hours later, they were deep among the hills, and then again halted after turning off from the track they had been following into a ravine. The girths were loosened and the horses allowed to graze, and the men, wrapping themselves in cloaks or blankets, were soon asleep, a sentry being placed at the entrance to the ravine. At ten o'clock, all were on their feet. Fires were lighted and breakfast cooked, and then, following mountain paths, they rode until two in the afternoon, at which time they reached the valley from which the party had before made their way down to the wood near the ravine. At dusk, they again mounted and rode on to the wood. They were met at the edge of the trees by Sim Hallett and Royce. I was expecting you tonight, boys, Sim said. We looked out for you last night, but I didn't reckon as you could possibly do it. Have you any news of my daughters? Don Ramon asked eagerly. Nary a word, Sim replied. Bill and me have never had our eyes off the house from sun up to sundown. Lots of fellas have come and gone on horseback. Of course, we cannot answer for what has been done after nightfall, but we reckon there is about 30 men there now, not counting those they may have in the village and the sentries down by the mouth of the valley. I calculate the best part of the gang is there now. The chiefs would like to keep them under their eye. They will think the only thing they have got to be afraid of is treachery. I suppose matters stand as they did when you left, Doc? Just the same. We four and Don Carlos are to go on and get at the ladies. When we are in there safe, three pistol shots are to be the signal. Then Don Ramon and the soldiers are to come down and surround them. Don Ramon had been very anxious to accompany the party, but the doctor had positively refused to take him with them. It would add greatly to our risks, he said, and do no good. If we can get to your daughters, Don Ramon, we five can keep the fellas at bay until you come up easily enough. I believe we could thrash the lot, but it is no good taking chances. But anyhow, we can keep them off. I would rather have gone without your son, but as Lightning has passed his word, there is nothing more to be said. On a job like this, the fewer there are, the better. Each man after the first pretty nearly doubles the risk. By this time, the troopers had dismounted and fastened their horses to the trees. Meat that had been cooked in the morning and biscuits were produced from their haversacks. When the meal had been eaten, the soldiers lit their pipes, while their officer proceeded with Hugh and the others to the lower end of the wood and walked on to the head of the ravine. There are the lights, Hugh said. Ah, I see they have lighted a fire on the terrace, Bill. I expect they are pretty crowded in the house, Bill said, but they go in to sleep. Sim and I have been down near the house twice, and though we were not quite close, we were able to make pretty sure that except one sentry there and another at the gate, the rest all go in. How far are we to go down? the officer asked. Well, I would rather you did not go down at all, Sim Hallett said. You can get down there from here in ten minutes after you start if you look spry, and I'm desperately afraid some of your men might make a noise, which they would hear certain if everything was quiet. There is no fear of their being heard when the firing once begins down there, but if one of them fell over a rock and his gun went off before we had done our part of the affair, there would be an end of the whole business. That is what I think, Sim, the doctor agreed. We have said all along we might get the ladies out by ourselves, but again we mayn't be able to get them off at all. But we can defend them easy enough if we can get into their room. Five minutes won't make any difference about that, and it is everything to avoid the risk of noise until we get at them. If they discover us before we get there, we just fall back fighting. They will think that we are only a small party, and the ladies will be none the worse. If you think that is the best way, we must agree to it, Don Ramon said. But we shall have a terrible time until we get to you. Don't you be afeard, Sim Hallett said. The doctor, me, Lightning, and Bill could pretty well wipe them out by ourselves, and we reckon on our six shooters a sight more than we do on the soldiers. End of chapter 18. Read by Dory Smith. Chapter 19 of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. A Fight and a Rescue. Soon after sunset, the five men started. The doctor was of opinion that it was better not to wait until the brigands had retired to rest. Of course, we cannot begin operations, he said, until all is quiet, but as long as the men are sitting around the fire smoking and singing, they will keep a very careless guard, and any noise we make will pass unobserved. 
When they once get quiet, the sentries will begin to listen, but until then we might almost walk up to their fires without being observed. It was necessary to move slowly and cautiously, lest they should fall over a rock or stump, but the doctor led the way and the others followed close behind him. Twenty minutes' stealthy walking took them to the spot whence the doctor had before reconnoitred the house. A fire blazed on the terrace, and some fifteen men were sitting or lying round it. The light fell upon bottles and glasses. One of the party was playing upon a mandolin and singing, but few of the others were attending to him, a noisy conversation plentifully sprinkled with Spanish oaths being kept up. The room where your sisters are confined, the doctor said to Don Carlos, is round the other side of the house. I did not mean to begin until all were asleep, but they are making such a noise down there that I do think it will be best to move at once, and if possible to let your sisters know that we are here. So we will work quietly round to that side. They had no sentry there last time, but they may have tonight. After twenty minutes of cautious movement, they reached the foot of the rock on which the house stood. The doctor had brought out from El Paso a small grapnel and rope. The former had been carefully wrapped round with strips of cloth so as to deaden any sound. It was now thrown up, and at the second attempt became firmly fixed above. "'Do you mount first, Latin?' he said to Hugh. "'When you get up, lie quiet for a minute or two. When you have quite assured yourself that all is clear, give the rope a shake. We others will come up one by one. Let each man, when he gets to the top, lie down.' Don Carlos followed Hugh, and the others soon joined them. "'You see that light there?' the doctor said to Don Carlos. That is your sister's room. As I told you, the windows on the ground floor are all blocked up, but three or four bricks have been left out just at the top of each for the sake of light and air. Now, Sim and you had better go together. He will stand against the wall, and if you climb onto his shoulders, I think you can just about reach that hole, pull yourself up, and look in. I need not tell you to be as silent as possible, for there may be someone in with them. If they are alone, tell them what we are going to do. See whether there are any bars inside the brickwork. I'm afraid there are sure to be. The Spanish houses most always have bars to the lower windows. Royce, you and I will go to the right-hand corner of the house. You go to the left, Lightning. If you hear anyone coming, give a low hiss as a warning. Then we must all lie down close to the wall. It is so dark now that unless a man kicks against us, he won't see us. If he does touch one of you, he is likely to think it is one of his own party lying down there for a sleep. But if he stoops over to see who it is, you have got either to stab him or to grip him by the throat so that he can't shout. Now, I think we all understand. The five men crawled cautiously to their respective stations. Now, young fella, Sim said to Don Carlos, if, when you are mounted on my shoulders, you find you cannot reach the hole, put your foot on my head. You won't hurt me with them moccasins on. Directly you've got your fingers on the edge, give a little pat with your foot to let me know, and I will put my hands under your feet and help hoist you up. You can put a biggish slice of your weight on me. When I'm tired, I will let you know. I will lean right forward against the wall. That will help you to climb up. Now. When he stood up on Sim's shoulders, the young Mexican found that he could reach the opening. Getting his fingers firmly upon it, he gave the signal, and with Sim's aid, had no difficulty in raising himself so that he could look into the room. Two candles burned upon the table, and by their light he could see the girls stretched on couches. Hush, girls, hush, he said in a low voice. It is I, Carlos. Silence for your lives. The two girls sprang to their feet. Did you hear it, Nina? The elder exclaimed in a low voice. Yes, it was the voice of Carlos. We could not both have been dreaming, surely. I am up here at the opening, Carlos said. We are here, girls, a party to rescue you. But we must get in beside you before we are discovered, or else harm might come to you. Wait a moment. He broke in as the girls, in their delight, were about to throw themselves upon their knees to return thanks to the virgin. I am being held up here and must get down in an instant. I can see that there is a grating to the window. Is it a strong one? Yes, a very strong one. Very well. We will saw through it presently. Do you keep on talking loudly to each other to drown any noise that we may make? That will do, Sim. You can let me down now. Now, young fella, Sim said as soon as Don Carlos reached the ground, you go along and tell Bill Royce to come here and help. The doctor will go on keeping watch. Then go to the other end and send Lightning here, and you take his place. He is better for work than you are. Sim was soon joined by Royce and Hugh. He had already set to work. These bricks are only adobe, he said. My knife will soon cut through them. In a few minutes, he had made a hole through the unbaked bricks. Senoritas, he said in Mexican, place a chair against this hole and throw something over it so that if anyone comes, it won't be observed. The men worked in turns with their keen bowies, and in half an hour the hole was large enough for a head and shoulders to pass through. Now for the files, Lightning. 
You may as well take the first spell as you have got them in the oil. It took two hours' work to file through the bars. Just as the work was finished, Sim said, You had better fetch the lad, Lightning. Send him through first. Don't you think, Doctor, Hugh said when they were gathered round the hole, that we might get the girls off without a fight at all? I doubt it, the doctor said. The men have just gone in except for two who are left as sentries, and the night is very still. They would be almost sure to hear some of us, and if they did, the girls might get shot in the fight. Still, it might be worth trying. As soon as you get in, Don Carlos, begin to move the furniture quietly against the door. All this time, the girls had been singing hymns, but their prudence left them as their brother entered the room. They stopped singing abruptly and threw themselves into his arms with a little cry of joy. Almost instantly, there was a loud knock at the door. What are you doing there? I am coming in. And the door was heard to unlock. Carlos threw himself against it. Fire the signal, doctor, Sim exclaimed as he thrust Hugh, who was in the act of getting through the hole, into the room. As he did so, three shots were fired outside. The instant Hugh was through, he leapt to his feet and ran forward. The pressure against the door had ceased. The man, having in his surprise at the sound of the shots, sprung back. Hugh seized the handle of the door so that it could not be turned. Pile up the furniture, he said to Don Carlos. Get into the corner of the room, senoritas. They will be firing through the door in a moment. By this time, a tremendous din was heard in the house. As yet, none of the brigands knew what had happened, and their general impulse was to rush out on the terrace to hear the cause of the shots. The doctor had followed Hugh closely into the room, the hole being large enough to admit of his getting through without any difficulty. Royce followed immediately, and as he got through, Sim Hallett's pistol cracked out twice as the sentries ran around the corner of the house, their figures being visible to him by the light from the fire. Then he thrust himself through the opening. The instant he was through, he seized one of the cushions of the couches and placed it across the hole by which he had entered. Several attempts had been made to turn the handle of the door, but Hugh held it firmly while the doctor and Carlos moved the couches and chairs against it. Here, doctor, you watch this hole. I will do that work, Sim said. They worked as silently as possible and could hear through the opening at the top of the window the sound of shouts and oaths as a number of men ran past on the terrace. Then one voice shouted angrily for silence. There's no one here, he said. Martinez, go in and fetch torches. What has happened? What have you seen, Lopez? I have seen nothing, the voice replied. I was lying close to the door when Domingo, who was on guard at the senorita's door, said something. Then almost directly, three shots were fired outside. I jumped up and unfastened the door and ran out. Martos and Juan, who were on guard outside, were just running across. I heard two more shots fired, and down they both fell. I waited a moment until all the others came out, and then we ran round the corner together. As far as I see, there is nobody here. Mil demonios, the first speaker exclaimed. It must be some plot to get the girls away. Perez, run in and ask Domingo if he heard any sounds within. Open the door and see that the captives are safe. There was a pause for a minute, and then Perez ran out. Domingo cannot open the door, he said. They are moving the furniture against it, and the handle won't turn. He says there must be something wrong there. Fool, what occasion is there to say that, as if anyone could not see there was something wrong? Ah, here come the torches. Search all round the terrace and ask whoever is on guard at the gate whether he has heard anything. We will see about breaking down the door afterwards. There was a pause, and then the men came back again. There is no one on the terrace. Nobody has been through the gate. Then there was a sudden, sharp exclamation. See here, Vargas, there is a hole here. The bricks have been cut through. A fresh volley of oaths burst out, and then the man in authority gave his orders. Perez, do you and Martinez take your post here? Whether there is one or half a dozen inside, they can only crawl out one at a time. You have only got to fire at the first head you see. The rest come inside and break open the door. We will soon settle with them. That is much better than I expected, the doctor said. We have gained nearly five minutes. Now let them come as soon as they like. Bill, will you stop at this end and guard this cushion? When the fight begins, they may try to push it aside and fire through at us. Let the upper end lean back a little against this chair. Yes, like that. Now you see, you can look down, and if you see a hand trying to push the cushion aside, put a bullet through it. Don't attend to us unless we are badly pressed and call for you. There was now a furious onslaught made on the door from the outside, heavy blows being struck upon it with axes and crowbars. Now, Sim, you may as well speak to them a little, the doctor said. When you have emptied your coal, I will have a turn while you are loading. The noise of the blows was a sufficient indication to Sim where the men wielding the weapons were standing. He had already recharged the two chambers he had emptied, and now, steadily and deliberately, he fired six shots through the panels of the door, and the yells and oaths told him that some of them had taken effect. 
There was a pause for a moment, and then the assault recommenced. The wood gave way beneath the axes, and the door began to splinter, while a number of shots were fired from the outside. The doctor, however, was stooping low, and the others stood outside the line of fire, while Bill at his end was kneeling by the cushion. The doctor's revolver answered the shots, and when he had emptied his pistol, Hugh took his place. By the furious shouts and cries without, there was no doubt the fire was doing execution. But the door was nearly yielding, and just as Hugh began to fire, one of the panels was burst in. The lock, too, had now given, the piece of wood he had jammed into it having fallen out. The Mexicans, however, were unable to force their way in, owing to the steady fire of the besieged, who had extinguished their candles and had the advantage of catching sight of their opponents through the open door by the light of the torches without. The besieged shifted their places after each shot, so that the Mexicans fired almost at random. For ten minutes the fight had raged when there was a sudden shout, followed by a discharge of firearms without. A cheer broke from the defenders of the room, and a cry of despair and fury from the Mexicans. The attack on the door ceased instantly, but a desperate struggle raged in the courtyard. This went on for three or four minutes, when the Mexicans shouted for mercy and the firing ceased. Then Don Ramon's voice was heard to call, Where are you? Are you all safe? There was a shout in reply. Then the furniture was pulled away and the splintered door removed, and as Don Ramon entered, his daughters, who had remained quietly in the corner while the fight went on, rushed into his arms. The success of the surprise had been complete. The man on guard at the gate had left his post to take part in the struggle going on in the house, and the officer in command of the troops had gained the terrace unobserved. He at once surrounded the house, and the two men outside the opening had been shot down at the same moment that he, with a dozen of his men, rushed into the courtyard and attacked the Mexicans. None of these had escaped. Eighteen had fallen in the house, four had been killed outside, and twelve had thrown down their arms and were now lying bound hand and foot in charge of the troops. No sooner had Don Ramon assured himself that his daughters were safe and uninjured than he turned to their rescuers and poured out his hearty thanks. They were not quite uninjured. Bill had escaped without a wound. Don Carlos was bleeding from a pistol ball which had grazed his cheek. Sim Hallett's right hand was disabled by a ball which had taken off his middle finger and plowed its way through the flesh of the forearm. Hugh had a bullet in the shoulder. The doctor's wound was the only serious one, he having been hit just above the hip. One of the soldiers had been killed and five wounded while fighting in the courtyard. Leaving Don Ramon and his son to question the girls as to what had befallen them and to tell them how their rescue had been brought about, the others went outside. Let's have a blaze, Lieutenant, Sim said. Most of us want dressing a bit and the doctor is hit very hard. Let us make a good big fire out here on the terrace. Then we shall see what we are doing. We were in a smother of gunpowder smoke inside. The officer gave an order and the soldiers fetched out billets of wood from the store and piled them on the fire on the terrace, and soon a broad sheet of flame leapt up. Now then, let us look at the wounds, Sim went on. Let us lift you up and make you a little comfortable, doctor. I'm afraid that there is no doing anything with you till we get you down to the town. All you've got to do is lie quiet. And drink, Sim. <laughs> Ay, and drink. I'm as thirsty myself as if I had been lost on an alkali plain. Bill, will you get us some drink? Plenty of water, with just a drop of spirit in it. There's sure to be plenty in the house somewhere. Roy soon returned with a large jar of cold water and a bottle of spirits. Only a few drops of spirits. Sim, if you don't want to get inflammation in that hand of yours. What had I better do for it, doctor? Well, it would be better to have that stump of the middle finger taken out altogether. I could do it for you if I could stand and had a knife of the right shape here. As it is, you can't do better than wrap your hand up in plenty of cloths and keep them wet, and then put your arm in a sling. What's yours, Lightning? I'm hit in the shoulder, Doctor. I don't think that it is bleeding now. Well, you had better get Bill to bathe it in hot water, then lay a plug of cotton over the hole and bandage it up. The doctor at the fort will get the ball out for you as soon as you get down there. He is a good man, they say, and anyhow, he gets plenty of practice with pistol wounds at El Paso. Royce did his best for his two friends. Then they all sat quietly, talking until the young officer came out from the house. "'We have been searching it from top to bottom,' he said. "'There is a lot of booty stored away. I want you to have a look at the two leaders of these scoundrels. They have both been shot. Don Ramon said that he believed they were the murderers of his son, and that two of you might recognize them if they were, as you did a horse trade with them.' Hugh and Royce followed him to the other side of the house, where the bodies of the brigands who had fallen had been brought out and laid down. Two soldiers brought torches. 
I have no doubt whatsoever that these are the men, Hugh said after examining the bodies of the two leaders who were placed at a short distance from the rest. Them's the fellas, Roy said positively. I could swear to them anywhere. They are notorious scoundrels, the officer said, and have for years been the scourge of New Mexico. They were away for a time two years ago. We had made the place so hot for them that they had to quit. We learned that from some of their gang whom we caught. They were away nearly a year. At least they were quiet. I suppose they carried on their games down in Texas till they had to leave there too, and then thinking the affair had blown over, they returned here. There has been a reward of $10,000 for their capture any time for the last five years. Properly, that ought to be divided between you, as it is entirely your doing that they have been caught. But as the reward says death or capture, I suppose my men will have to share it with you. That is right enough, Sim Hallett said. It will give us three or four hundred dollars apiece, and that don't make a bad week's work anyhow. What are you thinking of starting back, Lieutenant, and what are you going to do with this house here? I shall set fire to the house after we have got everything out of it. I guess it has been a den of brigands for the last ten years. I have sent four men down to keep guard at the mouth of the valley, and I expect we shall get all their horses in the morning. They must be somewhere about here. The prisoners will ride their own, and that will leave us twenty or more for carrying down the best part of the plunder. There is a lot of wine and other things that they have carried off from the haciendas that they plundered. I will send those down in carts with an escort of four of my men. Then I think we'd better get a bed in one of the carts and send my mate here down upon it. He's got a bullet somewhere in the hip and won't be able to sit a horse. We will send him off the first thing in the morning, the officer said. There is one of my own wounded to send down that way, too. I will go with them as nurse, Sim said. Get the cart to go straight through without a halt, Lieutenant. The sooner my mate is in the hands of your doctor, the better. I will see about it now, the Lieutenant said. No time shall be lost. I will send a sergeant and four men down to the village at once to requisition a cart and bring it here. It will be much better for them traveling at night. I will tell the men I send as escort to get hold of another cart in the morning and send them straight on. Thank you, Lieutenant. That will be the best plan by far. Don Ramon now came out of the house and joined the group. In the name of my children, their mother, and myself, I thank you most deeply, senors, for the noble way in which you have risked your lives for their rescue. Had it not been for you, God knows whether I should have seen my daughters again, for I know that no oaths would have bound those villains, and that when they had obtained the ransom, they would never have let my daughters free to give information that would have led to their capture. I shall always be your debtor, and the only drawback to my pleasure is that three of you have been wounded." The doctor here is the only one wounded seriously, Sim Hallett said. My hand and arm will soon heal up, and the loss of a finger is no great odds anyway. I don't suppose Lightning's shoulder will turn out worse than my arm. As for the doctor, he is hit hard, but he has been hit hard so many times and has pulled through it that I hope for the best. Signor Hugh, Don Ramon said, it was indeed a fortunate day for me when I questioned you concerning my son's horse, for it was to your advice and to your enlisting your friends on my behalf that I owe it chiefly that my daughters are with me this evening. I must leave it to their mother to thank you as you deserve. Two hours later, the doctor and one of the wounded soldiers were placed on a bed laid at the bottom of a cart and started under the escort of two soldiers, Sim Hallett accompanying them. As the girls had expressed the greatest disinclination to remain in the house where they had been prisoners and where so much blood had just been shed, they, with the rest of the party, returned with the sergeant and six soldiers carrying torches up the valley to the wood, where the horses had been left. Here two fires were soon blazing, and the girls were not long before they were asleep, wrapped in blankets that had been brought up from the house. The following morning, Hugh and Royce handed over their horses for the use of the girls, who were both accomplished horsewomen, and, mounting the horses of Sim and the doctor, they started with Don Ramon, his son, and daughters. Fifteen miles before they got to El Paso, they passed the cart with the wounded men, and Hugh said he would ride into the fort to ensure the doctor being there when they arrived. Royce and he accompanied Don Ramon and his party to the gate of the hacienda, which they reached just at sunset. The Mexican was warm in his entreaties to Hugh to become his guest until his wound was healed, but he declined this on the ground that he should be well cared for at the fort and should have the surgeon always on hand. I shall be over the first thing in the morning to see you, Don Carlos said. I shall want my own face strapped up, and I warn you, if the doctor says you can be moved, I shall bring you back with me. Royce accompanied Hugh to the fort. 
The commandant was highly gratified when he heard of the complete success of the expedition, and still more so when he learned that the two notorious brigands for whom he and his troopers had so often searched in vain were among the killed. Hugh was at once accommodated in the hospital, and the surgeon proceeded to examine his wound. It was so inflamed and swollen with the long ride, he said, that no attempt could be made at present to extract the ball, and rest and quiet were absolutely necessary. Two hours later, the cart arrived. The doctor was laid in a bed near that of Hugh, the third bed in the ward being allotted to Sim Hallett. The doctor's wound was pronounced by the surgeon to be a very serious one. It was some days before, under the influence of poultices and embrocations, the inflammation subsided sufficiently for a search to be made for the bullet in Hugh's shoulder. The surgeon, however, was then successful in finding it embedded in the flesh behind the shoulder bone, and having found its position, he cut it out from behind. After this, Hugh's progress was rapid, and in a week he was out of bed with his arm in a sling. The doctor, contrary to the surgeon's expectations, also made fair progress. The bullet could not be found, and the surgeon, after one or two ineffectual attempts, decided that it would be better to allow it to remain where it was. The stump of Sim's finger was removed the morning after he came in, and the wound had almost completely healed by the time that Hugh was enabled to leave the hospital a month after entering it. Don Ramon and his son had ridden over every day to inquire after the invalids and had seen that they were provided with every possible luxury, and he carried off Hugh to the hacienda as soon as the surgeon gave his consent to his making a short journey in the carriage. Doña Maria received him as warmly as if he had been a son of her own, and he had the greatest difficulty in persuading her that he did not require to be treated as an invalid and was perfectly capable of doing everything for himself. For a fortnight, he lived a life of luxurious idleness, doing absolutely nothing beyond going over in the carriage every day to see how the doctor was going on. Hugh saw that he was not maintaining the progress that he had at first made. He had but little fever or pain, but he lay quiet and silent and seemed incapable of making any effort whatever. Sim Hallett was very anxious about his comrade. He don't seem to me to try to get well, he said to Hugh. He looks to me like as if he thought he had done about enough and was ready to go. If one could rouse him up a bit, I believe he would pull round. He's gone through a lot, has the doctor, and I expect he thinks there ain't much worth living for. He just smiles when I speak to him, but he don't take no interest in things. Do you get talking with me when you go in, Lightning, and ask it about what we've been doing, and I will tell you some of the things he and I have gone through together. Maybe that may stir him up a bit. How long have you known him, Sim? I came across him in 49. I came round by Panama, being one of the first lot to leave New York when the news of gold came. I had been away logging for some months and had come down at the end of the season with six months' money in my pocket. I had been saving up for a year or two and was going to put it all in partnership with a cousin of mine who undertook the building of piers and wharves and such like on the Hudson. Well, the first news that met me when I came down to New York was that Jim had busted up and had gone out west, some said, others that he had drowned himself. I was sorry for Jim, but I was mighty glad that I hadn't put my pile in. Well, I was wondering what to start on next when the talk about gold began, and as soon as I learned there were no mistake about it, I went down to the wharf and took my passage down to the Isthmus. I'd been working about three months on the Yuba when I came across the doctor. I had seen him often before we came to speak. If you were to see the doctor now for the first time when he is just sitting quiet and talking that woman's sort of voice of his and with those big blue eyes— you would think maybe he was kind of softy, wouldn't you? I dare say I might, Sim. I saw him for the first time when he came up with you to take my part against that crowd of Mexicans. There didn't look anything soft about him then, and though I was struck with his gentle way of talking when I met him afterwards, I knew so well there was lots of fight in him that it didn't strike me he was anything of a softy, as you say. No? Well, the doctor has changed since I met him, but at that time he did look a softy and most people put him down as being short of wits. He used just to go about the camp as if he paid no attention to what were going on. Sometimes he would go down to a bit of a claim he had taken up and wash out the gravel, just singing to himself, not as though it were to amuse him, but as though he did not know as he were singing, in a sort of a curious off sort of voice. But mostly he went about doing odd sorts of jobs. If there were a man down with the fever, the doctor would just walk into his tent and take him in hand and look after him, and when he got better, would just drift away, and like enough not seem to know the man the next time he met him. Well, he got to be called Softy, 
but men allowed as he were a good fellow and was just as choked full of kindness as his brain would hold, and as he walked about, any chap who was taking his grub would ask him to share it, for it was certain that what gold he got wouldn't buy enough to keep a cat alive, much less a man. Well, it was this way. I got down with fever from working in the water under a hot sun. I hadn't any particular mates that time and were living in a bit of a tent made of a couple of blankets, and though the boys looked in and did any job that were wanted, I were mighty bad and went off my head for a bit, and the first thing I seen when I came round was Softy in the tent tended me. If he had been a woman and I had been his son, he couldn't have looked after me tenderer. I found when I began to get round he had been getting meat for me from the boys and making soups, but as soon as I got round enough to know what was going on, I pointed out to him the place where I had hid my dust, and he took charge of it and got me what was wanted, till I picked up and got middling strong again. As soon as I did, Softy went off to look after someone else who was bad, but I think he took to me more than he took to anyone else, for he would come in and sit with me sometimes in the evening, and I found that he weren't really short of wits as people thought, but would talk on most things just as straight as anyone. He didn't seem to have much interest in the digging, which were about the only thing we thought of. But when I asked him what he had come to the mining camps for, if it wasn't to get gold, he just smiled gently and said he had a mission. What the mission were, he never said, and I concluded that though he was all there and other things, his brain had somehow got mixed on that point, unless it were that his mission was to look after the sick. Well, we were a rough lot in 49, you bet. Lynch law hadn't begun, and there was rows and fights of the worst kind. Our camp had been pretty quiet until someone set up a saloon and gambling shop, and some pretty tough characters came. That was just as I were getting about again, though not able to work regular. It weren't long before two fellows became the terror of the camp, and they went on so bad that the boys began to talk among themselves that they must be put down. But no one cared about taking the lead. They had shot four fellows in the first week after they came. I hadn't seen Softy for ten days. He had been away nussing a woodman as had his leg broke by the fall of a tree. I was sitting outside my tent with the chap they call Red Sam. We had a bottle of brandy between us when them two fellas came along, and one of them just stooped and took up the bottle and put it to his lips and drank half of it off, and then passed it to the other without saying, by your leave or anything. Red Sam said, well, I'm blowed. When the fellow who had drunk whipped out his bowie, six shooters had hardly come in then, and before Red Sam could get fairly to his feet, he struck him under the ribs. Well, I jumped up and drew my bowie, for it were my quarrel, you see. He made at me. I caught his wrist as the knife was coming down, and he caught mine, but I were like a child in his arms. I thought it were all over with me when I heard a shout, and Softy sprang on the man like a wildcat and drove his knife right into him, and he went down like a log. The other shouted out an oath and drew. Softy faced him. It were the strangest sight I ever seen. His hat had fallen off, and his hair, which were just as white then as it is now, fell back from his face, and his eyes that looked so soft and gentle were just blazing. It came across me then, as it have come across me many a time since, that he looked like a lion going to spring. And I think Buckskin, as the man called himself, who had often boasted as he didn't fear a living thing, was frighted. They stood facing each other for a moment, and then Softy sprang at him. He was so quick that instead of Buckskin's knife catching him as he intended, just in front of the shoulder and going straight down to the heart, it caught him behind the shoulder and laid open his back pretty near down to the waist. But there were no mistake about Softy's stroke. It went fair between the ribs, and Buckskin fell back dead with Softy on the top of him. Well, after that it were my turn to nuss the doctor, for no one called him Softy after that. He were laid up for over a month, and I think that letting out of blood did him good and cleared his brain like. When he got well, he were just as you see him now, just as clear and as sensible a chap as you could see. Why, he has got as much sense as you would find in any man west of Missouri, and he's the truest mate and the kindest heart. I've never seen the doctor out of temper, for you can't call it being out of temper when he rises up and goes for a man. That is his mission. He has never got that out of his head and never will until he does. He can put up with a deal, the doctor can, but when a man gets too bad for anything, then it just seems to him as he has got a call to wipe him out, and he wipes him out, you bet. You don't want lynch law where the doctor is. He is a judge and a posse all to himself, and for years he was the terror of hard characters down in California. They was just scared of him, and if a downright bad man came to a camp and heard the doctor were there, 
he would in general clear straight out again. He has been shot and cut all over, has the doctor, and half a dozen times it seemed to me I should never bring him round again. It ain't no use talking to him and asking him why he should take on himself to be a judge and jury. When it's all over, he always says in his gentle way that he is sorry about it, and I do think he is, and he says he will attend to his own business in future. But the next time, it is just the same thing again. There ain't no holding him. You might as well try to stop a mountain lion when he smells blood. At such times, he ain't himself. If you had once seen him, you would never forget it. There were a British painting fellow who were traveling about taking pictures for a book. He were in camp once when the doctor's dander rose and he went for a man. And the Britisher said afterwards to me, it were like the berserk rage. I never heard tell of the berserks, but from what the old chap said, I guess they lived in the old time. Well, if they were like the doctor, I tell you that I shouldn't like to get into a muss with them. No, sir. Do you know what the doctor's history is, Sim? Yes, I do know, he said, but I don't suppose anyone else does. Maybe he will tell you some day if he ever gets over this. Oh, I don't want to know if it is a secret, Sim. Well, there ain't no secret in it, Lightning, but he don't talk about it, and in course I don't. It is a sort of thing that has happened to other men, and maybe after a bit they have got over it, but the doctor ain't. You see, he ain't a common man. He has got the heart of a woman, and for a time it pretty nigh crazed him. End of chapter 19. Read by Dory Smith. Chapter 20 of Ritzkin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G.A. Henty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, The Avenger. Hugh told the coachman to go back to the hacienda and to return for him late in the evening, and then went in with Sim. The doctor smiled faintly as Hugh sat down beside him and asked how he was getting on. I'm getting on, lad, he said. I reckon I shall be there before long. Hugh affected to misunderstand him. You must pick up strength, he said, or we shall never carry out that expedition among the Apaches, you know. If you wait for that, you will wait a long time, the doctor said quietly. I hope not, Hugh said cheerily. By the way, Sim, you told me you would tell me of some of your adventures in the early days of California. I am interested in that because I had an uncle there. He was ten years or so out there. What was his name, Latin? Sim asked. His name was Will Tunstall. An exclamation burst from both his hearers. "'Your uncle!' Sim exclaimed. "'Well, that beats all, and to think that we should have been all this time together and never known that. Is your name Tunstall, too?' "'Yes, Hugh Tunstall.' "'To think now, doctor,' Sim said. "'And we never knowed him except as Hugh or Lightning, and he is Will Tunstall's nephew. "'Well, lad, Bill, English Bill, we called him, was a mate of ours, and a better mate men never worked with.' "'You are like him, lad,' the doctor said in a voice so different from that in which he had spoken before that Hugh quite started. "'I thought you reminded me of someone, and now I know. It was English Bill. He was just as tall and as straight as you are, and laughed and talked just as you do. I wonder, Sim, we didn't notice it at once. Well, well, that is strange.' Hugh was greatly surprised. It was indeed strange that he should have met these two mates of his uncle. Stranger still that they should have entertained such evident affection for a man who seemed to him to differ in character so widely from them. He was surprised, too, at the doctor's remarks about his resemblance to his uncle, for he could see no likeness whatever. Well, he said, I should have had no idea that I was like my uncle. I think you must have forgotten his figure. He is tall and muscular, certainly, but he is much darker than I am, and, I think, altogether different. The doctor and Sim looked at each other with astonishment. There must be some mistake, Sim said. Do you say your uncle is alive now? Certainly I do, he replied and turned surprised. Ah, then, it isn't the same man, Sim said. Our Bill Tunstall was killed ten years ago. It is odd, too. Tunstall ain't a common name, at least not in these parts. If you had ever said your own name before, I should have noticed it and asked you about it. But Royce always called you Lightning or Hugh, and one may know men here for years by the name they have got without ever thinking what name they might be born with. Is Tunstall a common name in England, Lightning? The doctor asked. No, I don't think so, doctor. I never met any others. We came from the north of England, from Cumberland. So did English Bill, Sim said. Never heard tell of a chap that came out from there of that name, a tall, straight, strong fellow like you. He must have come out before you were born, though. Of course, we didn't know him for years afterwards. My uncle came out here before I was born, Hugh said, but 
but I never heard of anyone else of the same name doing so. Still, if your friend is dead, of course it isn't the same, for my uncle is alive. At least he was two years ago. He is strong and active and well-knit, but he is not tall as I am by two inches, I should say. Lift me up in bed, Sim, the doctor said excitedly. How long ago did your uncle return? Over six years ago, Hugh replied, surprised at the strange excitement upon the part of a man who, ten minutes before, had seemed to have no further interest in anything. Six years ago, Sim. You hear that? Six years ago. Gently, doctor, gently. What are you driving at? Sim asked, really alarmed at his mate's excitement. The doctor paid no attention to him. And he had been a great many years away, went away as a boy, and when he came back was so changed they wouldn't have known him. Yes, that was so, Hugh said, more and more surprised. You hear that, Sim? You hear that? The doctor exclaimed sharply. I hear it, mate, but do you lie down. You are not strong enough to be exciting yourself like this, though I'm blamed if I can see what it is about. What did he go home for? The doctor asked, still unheeding Sim. He went home because my father had died, and he came in for a considerable property, and he was one of my guardians. Do you hear that, Sim? The doctor cried in a loud, shrill voice that was almost a scream. Do you see it all now? Just you run and call the surgeon, Lightning. The doc's going clear off his head. Stop, the doctor said as Hugh was about to hurry off. If Sim wasn't that thick-headed, he would see what I see. Give me a drink. Hugh handed him a glass of lemonade, which he tossed off. Now then, Sim, haven't I told you this young fellow was like someone, though I couldn't mind who? Don't you see it as our mate, English Bill? Yes, he is like him, Sim said. Now you name it. He is a bit taller and his figure is loose yet, but he will widen out until he is just what Bill were. Like what his uncle was, the doctor broke in. Don't you see, Sim, his uncle was our mate. But how can that be, doctor? Don't you hear him say as his uncle is alive in England and didn't we bury poor Bill? You've heard Hugh say what his uncle came home for. What was Bill going home for, Sim? Ah, Sim exclaimed suddenly as a light flashed across him. It was just what Lightning has been saying. His brother was dead and he was going home to be guardian to his nephew and because he had come into an estate. Quite so, only he never went, Sim, did he? No, certainly he never went, Doc. There is no doubt about that. But somebody did go, the doctor said, and we know who it was, the man who killed him and stole his papers. An exclamation of astonishment broke from Hugh, while Sim exclaimed earnestly, By thunder, doctor, but you may be right. I reckon it may be as you say, though how you came to figure it out beats me. That must be it. We could never make out why he should have been killed. He had money on him, but not enough to tempt the man as we suspected suspected no the man we knew did it the doctor broke in you see now lightning how it is it was known in camp that our mate had come into an estate in england he said goodbye to us all and started and his body was found a few miles away we felt pretty sure of the man who had done it for he was missing he was a gambler bill had been pretty thick with him for some time and i allow the fella had got the whole story out of him and knew the place he was going to and knew where it was and had wormed a whole lot out of him that might be useful to him then he killed him and wasn't seen any more in these parts i searched for him for a year up and down california and nevada and new mexico and down into northern mexico but i never came across his track if i had got as much as a sign which way he had gone i would have hunted him down all over the world but there was not a sign from the day he had left the camp. Nobody ever heard from him again. I found out he had a wife down in Southern California, a Mexican girl, and I went down there to hunt her out, but she had gone too, had left a few days after he had disappeared. Now we are on his track again, Sim. I guess in a week I will be up, and you and I will go straight off with this young fellow to England and see this thing out. Lay me down now. I must be quiet for a bit. Take Lightning out and talk it over with him, and... Tell the cook to let me have some strong soup, for I've got to get out of this as soon as possible. Can all this be true, Sim, do you think? Hugh said. Or is the doctor lightheaded? Do you think it is possible that the man who murdered my uncle is the one who has taken his place all these years? It is gospel truth, Latinan. At least it is gospel truth that your uncle was murdered here, for there can't be no doubt that your uncle Bill Tunstall and our mate is the same man. But I can't say whether the one as you thought was your uncle is the one that killed him. Your description is like enough to him. Tell me a little more about him. 
He is rather dark with a mustache but no whiskers. He has a quiet manner. He is slight but gives you the idea of being very strong. He has very white, well-made hands. He shows his teeth a little when he smiles, but even when I first knew him, I never liked his smile. There was something about it that wasn't honest. And he brought over with him a Mexican wife. That's him, Sim said in a tone of conviction. You have just described him. He has a light sort of walk like a cat and a tigerish way with him all over. There ain't a doubt that is the man. And what is the woman like? She has always been very kind and good to me, Hugh said. No aunt could have been kinder. I am awfully sorry for her, but I hated the man. That was why I left England. I came into the room one day and found that he had knocked his wife down and I seized him. Then he knocked me down and I caught up the poker. I was no match for him then in strength. Then he drew a pistol, but I hit him before he could aim. And as he went down, his head came against a sharp corner of a piece of furniture. And I thought that I had killed him. So I bolted at once, made my way to Hamburg and crossed to New York. That is how I came to be here. Has he got much of the property, lad? He has got what was my uncle's share, Hugh replied. Now that I know who he is, I can understand things. I could not understand before. If I had died before I came of age, he would have had the whole of the property. He used to get the most vicious horses he could find for me to ride. And I remember now when we were in Switzerland together, he wanted to take me up mountains with him, but my aunt wouldn't let me go. Then he offered to teach me pistol shooting, but somehow he dropped that and my aunt taught me herself. I think she must have stopped him. Thinking it all over now, I feel sure that he must have intended to kill me somehow and that she managed to save my life. There were often quarrels between them, but she didn't seem to be afraid of him. I think that she must have had some sort of hold over him. Well, there is one thing, Sim said after a pause. I believe this here discovery has saved the doctor's life. He had made up his mind that he had done with it and wasn't going to try to get better. Now, you see, he is all eagerness to get on this fellow's scent. If he had been a bloodhound, he could not have hunted the country closer than he did for that thar tarnal villain. He had an idea it were his business to wipe him out, and when the doctor gets set on an idea like that, he carries it out. It will pull him round now. You see if it don't. I do hope so, indeed, Sim, Hugh said warmly. The doctor is a wonderful fellow, and if it hadn't been for him, we should never have arrived at this discovery. Well, I am glad. Of course, I am sorry to hear that my uncle was murdered, but as I never saw him, that does not affect me so much. But I am glad to hear that this man whom I hated, a man who ill-treated his wife and who spent all his time at horse racing and gambling, is not my uncle and has no right to a share in the property that has been in our family for so many years. I only hope that this excitement will not do the doctor any harm. I'm sure that it will do him good, Sim said confidently. But it were strange to see a man who looked as if he were just dying out wake up like that. But that has always been his way. Just as quiet as a woman at most times, but blazing out when he felt that were a great wrong and that it were his duty to set it right. I can tell you now what I know about his story. Now he knows you are English Bill's nephew, he won't mind your knowing. Well, his story ain't anything much out of the way. There are scores who have suffered the like, but it didn't have the effect on them like it did on the doctor. He is really a doctor trained and educated. He married out east. He were a quiet little fella and not fit to hustle round in towns and push himself forward. So he and his wife came round and settled in California somewhere about 36. There weren't many Americans here then, as you may guess. He settled down in the south somewhere a hundred miles or so from Los Angeles. He had some money of his own and he bought a place and planted fruit trees and made a sort of little paradise of it. That is what he told me he lived on, doctrine when it came in his way. There were some rich Mexicans about, and he looked after most of them, but I guess he did more among the poor. He had four children, and things went on peaceable till 48. Then you know gold was discovered and turned California upside down. It brought pretty nigh all the roughs in creation there. They quarreled with the Mexicans, and they quarreled with the Injuns, and there was trouble of the worst kind. There was gangs of fellas as guessed they could make more money by robbing the miners than they could by digging for gold. And I reckon they was about right. And when they weren't robbing the miners, they was plundering the Mexicans. Well, I never heard the rights of it. The doctor never could bring himself to talk about that. But one day, when he had been 20 miles away to visit a patient, he came back and found his place burned down and his wife and the four children murdered. 
He went off his head, and some of the people as knew him took him down to Los Angeles, and he were a year in the madhouse there. He were very quiet. I believe he used to just sit and cry. After a time, he changed. He never used to speak a word, but just sought with those big eyes of his wide open, with his face working as if he seen an enemy. Well, after a year, he got better, and the Mexicans let him out of that madhouse. Someone had bought his place, and the money had been banked for him. He took it and went off. He never got to hear who the gang were as had been to his house. I think the idea comes to him ever since when he comes across a really bad man that he were one of that lot, and then he goes for him. It is either that or he believes he has got sort of a special call to wipe out bad men. As I told you, he is always ready to do a kindness to anyone, and if he has killed over a score or more of the wuss men in California, I guess he has saved five times as many by nussing them when they are ill, only he will never give them medicine. One of his ideas is that if he hadn't gone on doctoring, he wouldn't have been away when that gang came to his house, and that is why he will never do anything as a doctor again. He is just a nuss, he says, and nothing more. Now, don't you go for to think, Lightning, that the doctor is the least bit mad, because he ain't, and never have been since I first knew him, and I should like to see the man as would say that he were. He is just as sensible as I am. That ain't saying much. He is ten times as sensible. He always knows the right thing to do, does the doctor, and does it. He are just an ornery man with heaps of good sense and just the kindest heart in the world. Only when there is regular downright bad man in the camp, the doctor takes him in hand all to himself. But Sim, I thought you were going about this gold business, this placer, directly the doctor was able to move. That has got to wait, Sim said. Maybe some day or other, when this business of yours is over, I may come back and see about it. Maybe I won't. If the doctor is going to England with you, I'm going. That is certain. Besides, even if I would let him go alone, which aren't likely, maybe his word wouldn't be enough. One witness wouldn't do to swear that this man who has stepped into your uncle's shoes ain't what he pretends to be. But if thar is two of us can swear to him as being Simmons the gambler, it'll go a long way. But you may have trouble even then. Anyhow, don't you worry yourself about the gold mine. Like enough, we should all have been wiped out by the Redskins if we had tried it. Now, I will look in and see how the doctor is before you go. Sim returned in two minutes, saying that the doctor had drank a bowl of soup and had told the orderly who brought it that he was going to sleep as he wanted to get strong, being bound to start for a journey in a week's time. As the carriage was not to return until late, Hugh started to walk over to Don Ramon's as he wanted to think over the strange news he had heard. Your friend is better, I hope, the signora said as he entered, or you would not have returned so soon. He is better, signora. We have made a strange discovery that has roused him up and given him new life while it has closely affected me. With your permission, I will tell it to you all. Is it a story, Senor Hugh? The young girl said. I love a story above all things. It is a very curious story, Senorita, as I am sure you will agree when you hear it, but it is long. Therefore, I pray you to make yourselves comfortable before I begin. As soon as they had seated themselves, Hugh told the story of the flight of his uncle as a boy, of his long absence and return, of the life at home and the quarrel that had been the cause of his own flight from home, and how he had that day discovered that his companions in their late adventure had been his uncle's comrades and friends, and how, comparing notes, he had found that his uncle had been murdered and that his assassin had gone over and occupied his place in England. Many exclamations of surprise were uttered by his auditors. And what are you going to do now, senor? I am going to start for home as soon as the doctor is well enough to travel. I should have been willing to have gone first with them upon the expedition upon which we were about to start when your daughters were carried off, but Sim Hallett would not hear of it. I intended to have had my say in the matter, Don Ramon said, and have only been waiting to complete my arrangements. I have not hurried because I knew that until your companion died or recovered, you would not be making a move. I am, as you know, senor, a very wealthy man, wealthy even for a Mexican, and we have among us fortunes far surpassing those of rich men among the Americans. In addition to my broad lands, my flocks and herds, I have some rich silver mines in Mexico, which alone bring me in far more than we can spend. The ransom that these brigands set upon my daughters was as nothing to me, and I would have paid it five times over had I been sure of recovering them. 
But you see, this was what I was not sure of, and the fact that they had not asked more when they knew how wealthy I was in itself assured me that they intended to play me false, and that it was their intention to keep them and to continue to extort further sums. You and your friends restored my daughters to me. Now, Signor Hugh, you are an English gentleman, and I know that you would feel the offer of any reward for your inestimable service as an insult, but your three companions are in a different position. Two are minors, and one is a vaquero. I know well that in rendering me that service, there was no thought of gain in their minds, and that they risked their lives as freely as you did, and in the same spirit, that of a simple desire to rescue women from the hands of scoundrels. That, however, makes no difference whatever in my obligation towards them. My banker yesterday received the sum in gold that I directed him to obtain to pay the ransom, and I have today given him orders to place three sums of $25,000 each at their disposal so that they need no longer lead their hard and perilous life, but can settle down where they will. I know the independence of the Americans, Signor, but I rely upon you to convince these three men that they can take this money without feeling that it is payment for their services. They have given me back my daughters at the risk of their lives, and they must not refuse to allow me in turn to make them a gift, which is but a small token of my gratitude, and will leave me still immeasurably their debtor. I will indeed do my best to persuade them to accept your gift, Don Ramon, and believe that I shall be able to do so. The doctor is a man of nearly sixty, and Hallett is getting on in years, and it would be well indeed for them now to give up the hard life they have led for so long. As to Bill Royce, I have no doubt whatever. I have heard him say many a time that his greatest ambition is to settle down in a big farm, and this will enable him to do so in a manner surpassing anything he can ever have dreamt of. And now, Signor, about yourself. What you have just told us renders it far more difficult than I had hitherto thought. We have talked it over, I, my wife, Carlos, and my daughters. I knew that you were a gentleman, but I did not know that you were heir to property. I thought you were, like others of your countrymen, who, seeing no opening at home, had come out to make your way here. What we proposed was this, to ask you whether your inclinations had turned most to cattle breeding or to mining. In either case, we could have helped you on the way. Had you said ranching, I would have put you as manager on one of my largest ranches on such terms that you would in a few years have been its master. Had you said mining, I would have sent you down to my mine in Mexico, there to have first learned the nature of the work, then to have become manager, and finally to have been my partner in the affair. But now, what are we to do? You are going home. You have an estate awaiting you, and our intentions have come to naught. I am just as much obliged to you, senor, as if you had carried them out, Hugh said warmly, and I thank you most deeply for having so kindly proposed to advance my fortunes. Had I remained here, I would indeed have accepted gratefully one or other of your offers. As it is, I shall want for nothing, and I can assure you I feel the small share I took in the rescue of your daughters is more than repaid by the great kindness that you have shown me. The next day, Hugh explained to two of his friends the gift that Don Ramon had made them. Bill Royce, to whom he first spoke, was delighted. Jehoshaphat, he exclaimed, that is something like. I thought when the judge here paid us over our share of the reward for the capture of those brigands that it was about the biggest bit of luck that I had ever heard of, but this beats all. That Don Ramon is a prince. Well, no more ranching for me. I shall go back east and buy a farm there. There was a girl promised to wait for me, but as that is eight years ago, I don't suppose she has done it. Still, when I get back with $25,000 in my pocket, I reckon I shan't be long before I find someone ready to share it with me. And you say I can walk right into that bank and draw it in gold? Yes, you can, Bill, but I shouldn't advise you to do it. How am I to take the money then, Lightning? The bank will give you an order on some bank in New York, and when you get there, you can draw the money out as you like. Sim Hallett received the news in silence. Then he said, Well, Hugh, I don't see why we shouldn't take it. As Don Ramon says, it isn't much to him, and it is a big lump of money to us. I would have fought for the gals just as willing if they had been peons. But seeing as their father's got more money than he knows what to do with, it is reasonable and natural as he should want to get rid of the obligation to us. And anyhow, we saved him from having to pay $200,000 as a beginning, and perhaps as much as that over and over again afore he got them back. We had best say nothing to the doctor now his mind is set on one thing, and he is going to get well so as to carry it out. When that job is over, it will be time enough to tell him about this. 
I'm beginning to feel too stiff for work, and the doc was never good that way, and he is getting on now. I shall be able to persuade him when the time comes, and shall tell him that if he won't keep his money, I shall have to send mine back. But he is too sensible not to see, as I do, that it is reasonable on the part of the doc, and if he don't want it himself, he can give it to a hospital and share mine with me. I reckon we shall hang together as long as we both live, so you can tell the Don it is settled, and that though we had no thought of money, we won't say no to his offer. Now that the doctor had made up his mind to live, he recovered with wonderful rapidity and in a fortnight was ready to travel. Hugh took leave of Don Ramon and his family with great regret. They were all much affected at parting with him, and he was obliged to promise that if he ever crossed the Atlantic again, he would come and pay them a visit. Prince went back to his old stable, for the party were going to travel down the Rio Grande by boat. At Matamoros, the port at its mouth, they went by a coasting steamer to Galveston, and thence by another steamer to New York. Here Royce left them, and the other three crossed by a Cunarder to Liverpool. The quiet and sea voyage quite restored the doctor, who was by far the most impatient of them to get to the journey's end. They had obtained a complete rig-out of what Sim called store clothes at New York, though Hugh had some difficulty in persuading him to adopt the white shirt of civilization. On arriving, Hugh wrote to Mr. Randolph, saying that he had news of very great importance to communicate to him, but that he did not wish to appear at Carlisle until he had seen him, and therefore begged him to write and make an appointment to meet him at Kendall on the third day after he received the letter. The answer came in due time. It was short and characteristic. My dear Hugh, I am delighted to hear that you are back in England again. You behaved like a fool in going away, and an even greater one in staying away so long. However, I will give you my opinion more fully when I see you. I am very glad, for many reasons, that you have returned. I can't think what you want to say to me, but I will arrive at Kendall by the train that gets in at twelve o'clock on Thursday next. When Mr. Randolph got out of the train at Kendall, Hugh was awaiting him on the platform. Bless me, is this you? he exclaimed as the young fellow strode up to him. You were a big lad when you left, but you are a big man now and a tunstall all over. Well, I have been gone nearly three years, you see, Mr. Randolph, and that makes a difference at my age. I am past nineteen. Yes, I suppose you are, now I think of it. Well, well, where are we to go? I have got a private sitting room at the hotel and have two friends there whom I want to introduce you to. When I tell you that they have come all the way with me from Mexico to do me a service, they are, you will acknowledge, friends worth having. Well, that looks as if there were really something in what you have got to say to me, Hugh. Men don't take such a journey as that unless for some strong reason. What are your friends? For as I have no idea what you have been doing these three years, I do not know whether you have been consorting with princes or peasants. With a little of both, Mr. Randolph. One of my friends is a Californian miner and as good a specimen of one as you can meet with. The other is a doctor, or rather, as I should say, has been a doctor, for he has ceased for some years to practice and has been exploring and mining. And they have both come over purely for the sake of doing you a service? Mr. Randolph asked, elevating his eyebrows a little. Simply that, Mr. Randolph, strange as it may appear to your legal mind. However, as this is the hotel where we are putting up, you won't be kept much longer in a state of curiosity. Sim and Doctor, this is my oldest friend and trustee, Mr. Randolph. Mr. Randolph, these are my two very good friends, Dr. Hunter and Mr. Sim Howlett. In the States, introductions are always performed ceremoniously, and the two men shook hands gravely with the lawyer. I said, Mr. Randolph, Hughes went on, that they were my good friends. I may add that they were also good friends of my late uncle, William Tunstall. Of your late uncle, Hugh? What are you thinking about? Why, he is alive and well, and more's the pity, he muttered to himself. I know what I am saying, Mr. Randolph. They were dear friends of my late uncle, William Tunstall, who was foully murdered in the town of Sacramento in California on his way to San Francisco in reply to your summons to return to England. Mr. Randolph looked in astonishment from one face to another as if to assure himself that he heard correctly, but their gravity showed him that he was not mistaken. Will Tunstall, murdered in California, he repeated. Then who is it that... The man who murdered him and who, having possessed himself of his letters and papers, came over here and took his place, a gambler of the name of Simmons. My friend obtained a warrant from the sheriff at Sacramento for his arrest on this charge of murder, and for upwards of a year Dr. Hunter traveled over California and Mexico in search of him. 
It never struck them that it was anything but a case of murder for the money he had on him. The idea of the step Simmons really took, of personating the man he had murdered, never occurred to them. We met in New Mexico and were a considerable time together before they learned that my name was Tunstall, for out there men are known either by their Christian names or by some nickname. Then at once they said they had years before had a mate of the same name, and then gradually, on comparing notes, the truth came out. Well, 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 Mr. Randolph murmured, seating himself helplessly in a chair. This is wonderful. You have taken away my breath. This is amazing indeed. I can hardly take it in yet, lad. You are sure of what you were saying? Quite sure that you are making no mistake? Quite certain. However, the doctor will tell you the story for himself. This the doctor proceeded to do, narrating the events at Cedar Gulch, how the murder had been discovered and the body identified, how a verdict of willful murder against some person unknown had been returned by a coroner's jury, how he and Sim Hallett had gone down to Sacramento, and how they had traced the deed to the gambler Simmons. There can be no doubt, Mr. Randolph said when he concluded, that it is as you say, and that this man is William Tunstall's murderer. And we shall be able to bring him to justice, shall we not? Hugh asked. That was why I wanted you to meet me here, so that we could arrange to arrest him before he had any suspicion of my return. Ah, that is a different thing altogether, Hugh. The evidence of your two friends and the confirmation that can doubtless be obtained from Sacramento as to the existence of the gravestone erected to William Tunstall and of the finding of the coroner's court will no doubt enable us to prove to the satisfaction of the courts here that this scoundrel is an impostor. But the murder case is different. In the first place, you would have to bring forward the charge and give your evidence in the United States and obtain an application for his extradition. British law has no jurisdiction as to a murder committed in a foreign country. Having set the United States authorities in action, you would return here and aid in obtaining an order from a magistrate here for that extradition. The evidence of your friends would doubtless be sufficient to induce a magistrate to grant such an order, and then he would be taken over to the States and, I suppose, sent down to California to be tried there. Your friends here will be best able to judge whether any jury out there would convict a man for murder committed eight or ten years ago unless the very strongest evidence was forthcoming. It would be next to impossible to obtain the evidence of those people, the waiters and others, from whom your friends gleaned the facts that put them upon the trail of Simmons, and without that evidence there is no legal proof that would hang a man. Morally, of course, there would seem to be no doubt about it. He and you were in the mining camp together. He knew the object for which Will Tunstall was leaving for England, and that he was entitled to considerable property upon arriving here. He followed him down to Sacramento, or at any rate, he went down at that time. They were together drinking. There your uncle was found murdered. This man appeared here with the letters that your uncle carried and obtained possession of the estate. It is a very strong chain of evidence, and were every link proved might suffice to hang him here. But at present, you have no actual proof that Simmons ever was in Sacramento with him, or was the man he was drinking with, and even could you find the waiters and others, it is very unlikely that there would be anyone to identify him after all this time. Simmons' counsel would argue that there was no proof whatever against his client, and he would, of course, claim that Simmons knew nothing about the murder, but that afterwards obtained the papers from the man who really committed the murder, and that the idea of coming over to England and personating Tunstall then for the first time occurred to him. So, I think you would find it extremely difficult to get a verdict out in California merely on the evidence of these two gentlemen, and of my own that he was possessed of a letter I wrote to Tunstall. But in any case, if you decide to have him arrested on the charge of murder, you will have to go back to California to set the law in motion there, to get the state authorities to apply to the supreme authorities of the United States to make an application to our government for his arrest and extradition. You must do all this before he has any idea that you have returned, or at any rate, before he knows that you have any idea of his crime. Otherwise, he will, of course, fly, and we shall have no means of stopping him, and he might be in Fiji before the application for his arrest was received here. Hugh and his companions looked helplessly at each other. This was an altogether unexpected blow. They had imagined they had but to give their evidence to ensure the arrest, trial, and execution of William Tunstall's murderer. The doctor's fingers twitched, and the look that Sim Hallett knew so well came into his eyes. He was about to spring to his feet when Sim touched him. 
Wait, doctor, he said. We will talk about that afterwards. Then what do you advise, Mr. Randolph? Hugh asked after a long pause. I should say that for the present we should content ourselves with arresting him on the charge of impersonation and of obtaining possession of your uncle's estate by fraud. I think the proof we now have, in the evidence of these two gentlemen, and in this copy of the finding of the coroner's jury, will be quite sufficient to ensure his conviction, in which case he will get, I should say, seven years penal servitude, perhaps fourteen. For although he will not be charged with that offense, the conviction that he murdered your uncle in order to obtain possession of the estate cannot but be very strong in the mind of the judge. Yes, I should think he would give him fourteen years at least. We may, of course, want some other evidence that can be obtained from Sacramento, such as an official copy of the record of the proceedings at the coroner's inquest, but that would be a matter for counsel to decide. My own opinion is that the evidence of these two gentlemen that the William Tunstall, who corresponded with your father, received my letter informing him of the will and left the mining camp on his way to England and was murdered on his way to Sacramento, was the real William Tunstall, will be quite sufficient. It is a very lucky thing for you, by the way, Hugh, that there were provisions in your father's will that if William Tunstall died without issue, his half of the property came back to you, for that clause has effectually prevented him from selling his estate, which he would have done long ago had it been possible to do so. To my knowledge, he has tried over and over again, and that clause has always prevented it. He has raised a little money on his life interest, but that will, of course, have no claim on the estate now. Now, what do you say? It is for you to decide. In the one case, you will have an enormous amount of trouble, and you may finally fail in getting an American jury to find this man guilty of the murder. And, in any case, if they do find him so, they will not execute him for a murder committed so long ago, and it is probable that he will get off with imprisonment for life, and may be acquitted altogether. On the other hand, if you have him arrested at once here, on the charge of impersonation and fraud, he is morally certain of getting a sentence which, at his age, will be pretty nearly equivalent to imprisonment for life. I certainly think that is the best plan, Hugh agreed. Don't you think so? He asked, turning to the others. I think so, Sim Hallett said at once, and even the doctor, though less readily, agreed. Since his last illness, he had changed a good deal. He had no longer fits of abstraction and was brighter and more cheerful than Sim Hallett had ever seen him before. The loss of blood and the low fever that had brought him to death's door had apparently relieved his brain of a load that had for years oppressed it. Let it be so, he said reluctantly. Had we met out in the West, it would have been different, but as it is, perhaps it is best. Late that evening, the party proceeded to Carlisle, and early the next morning, Mr. Randolph went with the others to one of the county magistrates, and after laying all the facts before him, obtained a warrant for the arrest of John Simmons, alias William Tunstall. I must congratulate you, Mr. Tunstall, the magistrate said to Hugh, after he had signed the warrant, upon your discovery. This scoundrel has been a disgrace to your name. He has been for years a consorter with betting men and blacklegs, and stands in the worst odor. It is said that he has mortgaged his life interest in the estates and completely ruined himself. Mr. Randolph nodded. Yes, I believe he is pretty well at the end of his tether, and at any moment he might be turned out of Burnside. Well, there is an end to all that, the magistrate said and the men who have proved themselves even sharper rogues than he is will be disappointed. I am sorry for the person who has passed as your aunt, for I know that she is spoken well of by the people in the neighborhood, and I fancy she has had a very hard time of it with him. But, of course, she must have been his accomplice in this impersonation of your uncle. I am sorry for her, very sorry, Hugh said. She was always most kind to me, and I have reason to believe that she did all in her power to protect me from him. You see, at my death, he would have inherited the whole property, and we now know that he was not a man to stick at anything. I am sure that she acted in fear of him. I have private reasons for believing so, too, Mr. Randolph said, for, unless I am greatly mistaken, she has deposited a document that, in case of her death, would have exposed the whole plot in the hands of some legal friends of mine. However, we will not occupy your time any longer, but will start at once with a couple of constables to execute this warrant. Returning to Carlisle, Mr. Randolph secured the services of two constables, and hiring vehicles, they started at once for Burnside. On arriving there, Mr. Randolph said to the servant, Announce me to Mr. Tunstall. Do not say that I am not alone. 
Following him closely, they went across the hall, and as he opened the door and announced Mr. Randolph, the others entered. The man was standing on the hearth rug. The woman looked flushed and excited. They were evidently in the midst of a quarrel. Simmons looked up in angry surprise when the party entered. Do your duty, Mr. Randolph said to one of the constables. John Simmons, I arrest you under a warrant on the charge of impersonation and fraud. A deep Mexican oath burst from the lips of the man. Then he stood quiet again. Who dares bring such a charge against me, he asked. I do, Hugh said, stepping forward. And these are my witnesses, men who knew you at Cedar Gulch and who identified the body of my murdered uncle. Traitress, Simmons exclaimed in Mexican. And in an instant, his arm was stretched out and there was a report of a pistol. And she sent you out, he exclaimed, turning to Hugh. But as he was in the act of again raising his arm, there was the report of another pistol, and he fell shot through the brain. The others stood stupefied at the sudden catastrophe, but the doctor said quietly, I saw his hand go behind him and knew he was up to mischief. I ought not to have waited. It is always a mistake to wait in these cases. Hugh sprang forward towards the woman who had been kind to him, but she had fallen back in her chair. The gambler's bullet had done its work. It had struck her on the temple, and death had been instantaneous. The excitement in the county when the news spread of what had taken place at Burnside was great indeed, and the revelations made before the coroner's jury greatly added to it. They returned a verdict that Lola Simmons had been willfully murdered by John Simmons, and that the latter had come by his death at the hands of Frank Hunter, who had justifiably shot at and killed him while opposing by armed means the officers of the law, and that no blame attaches to the said Frank Hunter. When all was over, Hugh was warmly congratulated by the gentleman who had come in to be present at the inquest upon his recovery of the whole of his father's estate and upon his escape from the danger he had certainly run at the hands of the murderer of his uncle. He was much affected by the death of the woman he still thought of as his aunt, and the document that she deposited at the lawyers in London showed how completely she had acted under fear of her husband and that she had knowingly risked her life to save his. The doctor and Sim Hallett remained for a fortnight with him at Burnside. He had urged upon them to make it their home for a while and to settle near him. But at the end of that time, the doctor said to him one evening, Sim and I have talked matters over, Hugh, and we have made up our minds. I have heard from him that we are each the owners of $25,000. I should not have taken it had I known it at the time, but I should not like to hurt the Don's feelings by sending it back now, and perhaps it will do more good in my hands than in his. So, Sim and I are going back to California. We shall buy a place near the spot where I lived so many years ago. Sim tells me he has told you the story. And there we shall finish our days. When we die, the money will go to charities. That is our plan, lad. We shall find plenty to help. And what with that and a little gardening, our time will be well occupied. And Sim and I will have plenty in the past to look back upon and talk about. And so a week later they sailed. Hugh went with them to Liverpool and saw them off and then traveled for a time on the continent, for Burnside was repugnant to him after the tragedy that had been enacted there. On his return, he went down to Norfolk and stayed for some time with Luscombe, and the visit was so pleasant that it was repeated whenever he happened to be in England. Three years later, he crossed the Atlantic again. He traversed the states more easily now, for the railway across was almost completed. After spending a month in California with the doctor and Sim Hallett, whom he found well and happy, he visited Don Ramon at El Paso. There had been changes here, for both Don Carlos and his two sisters were married and all insisted upon his being their guest for a time. His first visit after his return to England was again to Norfolk. It was a short but important one, and on its termination he went back to Burnside to give orders for many changes and alterations that were to be made with all speed in view of the coming of a new mistress. It had for some time past been apparent to Luscombe that the remark he had laughingly made years before on the banks of the Canadian was likely to bear fruit, and that his sister Phyllis constituted no small portion of the attraction that brought Hugh down to Norfolk. Indeed, before leaving for the States, Hugh had chatted the matter over with him. Of course, you have seen, Luscombe, how it has been. I shall be three and twenty by the time I get back, which is quite young enough for a man to talk about marriage. As soon as I do, I shall ask Phyllis." Just as well to wait, Hugh. It seems to me that you and Phyllis pretty well understand each other, but I don't see any use in engagements till one can fix a date for the marriage, and as you have made up your mind to go on this trip, it will save you both a lot of trouble in the way of writing to leave it alone until you come back. 
It is a horrid nuisance to keep on writing letters when you are traveling. Besides, you know the governor has strong ideas against early marriages and will think you quite young enough then, and so I should say, leave it as it stands. And so Hugh had left it. But it is doubtful whether he had left Phyllis quite in ignorance of what would be said on his return. At any rate, no time was required by her before giving an answer to the question when it was put, and two months later the marriage took place. Many as were the presents that the bride received, they were thrown completely into the shade by that which arrived as a joint gift from Don Ramon and his family a few days before the wedding being sent by their order from Tiffany's, the great jeweler of New York. It consisted of a case of jewelry of extraordinary value and magnificence and was, as Mr. Luscombe Sr. remarked, suitable rather for a princess of royal blood than for the wife of a Cumberland squire. The return of Mr. and Mrs. Tunstall after the termination of their honeymoon to Burnside was hailed with great rejoicing by the tenantry, who were happy to know that the old state of things had at last returned, and that a resident landlord with an English wife would in future be established in the family mansion. The End End of Chapter 20 End of Redskin and Cowboy, A Tale of the Western Plains by G. A. Henty Read by Dory Smith